There we go. All right, there's that. There's that. All right, let's do this count on three. One, two, three. Here we go. So sorry. Sorry. Hi. There we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you doing? Um, to quote a TikTok, physically, I'm unwell. Mentally, I'm unwell. Um, <laughs> I, ah. The joke is, as you were opening, my brain just immediately went, for the first time, I think, in months, I went, huh, that's weird. Do I stop her? She didn't say famous fatalities edition. You're not doing that anymore, Christine. <laughs> like, it's I, been some time. It's, yeah. It's been a while. I'm a shell. And I, <laughs> I, I just, you know, it is, it is what it is. And uh, long story short, I'm here. You know? And I couldn't be happier. I... I uh, can't imagine a better way to ring in my birthday. Listen, uh, if you're listening to the show, which you are, you might be wondering where where'd this episode go? Uh, because the last time you listened to us, if you're you know listening week to week, first of all, thank you muchly. Appreciated. Um, we teased that the next episode, and we didn't lie because this is the next episode. It is. Technically, I, this was the next one. Exactly. But I think people thought that it was coming a week ago and yeah. there was no episode a week ago, no. but there's a very good reason why. And that's what uh, dear Christy has just alluded to, which is we're in the, I was about to say, I was about to sing the wedding March song, which is not what, no, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to go bomb, 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 bomb. No, it's her birthday season. That's what I'm trying to say apparently also unwell <laughs> over here. Uh, and so I planned a giant ruse. Uh, if, you, if you follow us on, uh, on the social media, as you may have seen that by now, if you don't give us a follow on Instagram at true crime and cocktails, Facebook, YouTube, the same, and then Twitter at not detectives. Uh, and uh, there you can find a video that I put together of the moment I surprised her, which mm -hmm. was delicious. I have to say, yeah. Oh, it was so good. Um, and so consequently, we spent an unexpected, well, expected for me, unexpected for her weekend together. And you know what we did? Just enjoyed it. We did. It, we took a break. We, we haven't we haven't taken a break from work without exaggeration since August 2020. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, people, people who found out we were together were like, oh, are you going to record an episode while you're together? And I think maybe I had thought that might happen, but it became very evident very quickly that we just wanted to bask in the time. We did. We just wanted to hang out, apparently mentally become seven years old and just take up space in my bed and yeah. just, just be to the point like being there for so long that multiple members of my family came down the hall just to make sure we were still okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the best moment was when her oldest son came in and asked what we were doing and she just went playing. <laughs> I mean, the bed was literally covered in toys. It was. We, yeah, yeah we'll get to that in a second. We, we did really connect to our inner youths, yeah. uh, which was a beautiful thing. Um, but we did do a, a live for Patreon, patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails. If you want some bonus content from us, that's where to find it. Um, but other than that, we just, yeah, we just hunkered down, but you know, it's, I think it's important because first of all, it, we need a break. You yeah. especially need a break. Um, and when I want to say I've had breaks by that, I mean, I've had breaks to do other work. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's, uh, 
I still work on the podcast every day in some respect, but when I've had a break from it again, it's doing other work. So it's not, yeah. not really a break. So that's the first thing we, we just deserve breaks because humans need breaks. Yeah. But the second thing is, you know, again, the magic of this show, of course, is our relationship with each other and our love for each other. And it was, I think it was important to, to have that time to have that, uh, to, to dip back into the well so that we can come back into the show now and be refreshed. Yes. We, we needed it. I mean, we the did. last, we, we did, we did get to see each other for a chunk of time in April, uh, when I was California breaking. Yeah. Uh, but we were, I was doing notes constantly and like, we were working so much then. And this time it was like, we're not, we discussed like work stuff and upcoming episodes, things like that and scheduling and stuff. But this time we were just like, let's just lay down and apparently laugh harder than we've laughed in in years. In years. It was a joy. It was a joy. It was a joy top to bottom. And, you know, for those who, who don't know, I think we talked about it only on a, a Patreon bonus episode, but we, when we were teens, we hadn't seen it. We didn't see each other all the time. And there was one trip where we, we got together and we would always talk music and we both had discovered this band called Radish. Yeah. I would say shout out if they're listening, but again, why do we always do that? It's like, what are the chances? But in the grand scheme of anything being possible, it is possible. So shout I mean, out to Radish. To, to be fair, we, we shouted out Age of Electric and we know them now. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You know so, what? Shout yeah. out to Radish. We enjoy your music and your work. Yeah. Um, but we had both kind of found them, you know, com- being living in completely different places, yeah. uh, which was always the, the synchronicity of our relationship. And much like that, we discovered something even now that we had a, a synchronicity, uh, a synchronistic moment about, which was... <laughs> these unboxing videos we both have discovered that we enjoy on TikTok yeah. of, a, of a child's item, a child's toy. And long story short, we got knee deep into it ourselves and just yeah. truly laughed harder than I think we have honestly in years. And we laugh pretty yeah. hard every week on this show, uh, yeah. especially in the Glee Curse episode. Check it out if you haven't, it's a romp. Um, <laughs> I'm, I've decided I'm going to make that one of my catchphrases now. Like you're as a mother. (laughs) No, the Glee, check out the Glee curse episode. (laughs) A full bit. I like it. Cause I've, uh, I've said it so many times. Um, but yeah, it was just, ah, it was just so stupid and so funny and, uh, just the best, just the best. Yeah. And again, I mean, you said child's toy. I don't know if these are made for children. Great point. Marketed to to children, but it is a hundred percent. Some of the boxes are little cardboard boxes and I just get concerned that a child will just destroy them. Yeah. We're talking about mini brands folks. And if you don't know what those are, Google it, or I'll give you a quick synopsis. Basically there's a ball that you receive and you open it and it is, it's plastic and it is sliced out like a Terry's chocolate orange which tis the season. I'm also wearing True Crime and Cocktails Christmas holiday merch right now. TrueCrewMerch.com is the only place to get that. Um, But in each slice of this plastic Mm -hmm. orange, there is a miniature version of a food, like a a little shake and bake or a little bag of of frozen French fries or whatever. And they're so cute. And we just got into it. And I think for me, part of it is like the competitive nature like then yes. I get, I get warm. Like, it's like, I just want to collect them all for what and why, who knows? It doesn't matter. It was, a, it was a laugh. And we kept saying, yeah. we're like, it, yes, these are exorbitantly expensive, and, but that's not the, it's, it's, you can't put a price on the memories and the fun. And I know that sounds yeah. like I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm not. Oh, we like the, the particular set, because of course there's multiple series, the particular series that I was drawn to that I'm collecting has over a hundred pieces yeah. you can collect. Yep. And we got to a point where it was like, well, what am I going to do with these? And the answer is I'm going to buy the mini store that you can buy to put them in. And I'm like, mm-hmm. where am I going to put that? The answer is, I don't know, probably on the shelves back there. But the point is every time I look at it, I'm going to think of some of the most ridiculous things that we said Yeah, and burst out laughing. And it's like, oh, that's going to give me joy every day. 
Oh, why yeah. wouldn't I want that? Not to mention the fact that I have since added it to my like Christmas list. I don't have a specific list, but like my husband will ask uh, if there's anything in particular. I've added it to my list, but you know who else has added it? My youngest. <laughs> so the two of us, just the oldest and the youngest in the house have really come together and decided this is it. You know how like Lego will say it's for like ages nine to 99, apparently mini brands ages six to 40. <laughs> it's what I well, don't put that cap on it. Cause then next year, what you're going to have to give it up. Come on. Oh, I better have series two fully by then. <laughs> yeah. That's where I'm at. Yeah. What I also love is uh, Christy revealed that her youngest is into it. And what do I say? I was like, well, now you've got someone to trade with earnestly, <laughs> earnestly. Oh, and then she the... said to me at one point, like, well, you better look into, <laughs> into joining some trade groups. And I was like, I know, <laughs> I know. Oh, it's yeah. just, it's so silly, but it was just so fun. Um, yeah. It's yeah, truly what a, again, like the clique, <laughs> The classic true crime and cocktails episode, the Glee clerk curse. What a romp. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can't stop. Can't yeah. stop. Um, it should also be noted because people are wondering, I'm sure. Yeah. It, maybe not. But maybe three of you for those. Uh, and Radish, who is obviously listening also. How did I surprise Christy? Well, I very quickly have to give you just a quick synopsis because I I shouldn't be as proud of myself as I am. No, you should but be. It was it good. Was, it was my such a- only anger has been towards my husband, where after you posted the video, I turned to him and went, really? Couldn't have told me, maybe don't wear the toque in the airport. You looked adorable. Oh, I was, you're lucky I wasn't there in jams. I'll tell you that. (laughs) I almost showed up in pajamas. That would have been classic me, but. Pajama jammy jam. Um, So I, Christy knew that I had a package that I needed to, to mail to her. And so I sent her a voice note, which I'll try and post at least part of, because I want people to hear my performance, if I'm being honest. Of course. An actor acts for an audience. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So I sent her this voice note that was basically like, it starts out with the statement, I've done something. Because then I know I've got her on my side. Now it also should be noted, in our entire relationship, 38 years. I've lied to her one time only. And it was to get her to the location for her surprise bachelorette party. So I have so much goodwill. I'm like, I just know that she'll probably, if I come up with something plausible, she'll believe me because she has no reason not to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I said, look, I went to mail the package and I don't know. I just wasn't thinking I was, I was tired. They asked me if I owned a small business. And for some reason I said, yes, I guess I do technically with the merch store. Anyway, there's this new shipping option that they've, they've put into place because of the supply chain issues that have been going on. It's to help take a a little bit of the burden off of mail carriers. Basically what it is, if you own a small business, you can ship for a very low price. It gets there in just internationally in a couple of days, but you have to have someone who works for your business on the other end pick up the package from the airport. That way it doesn't have to go to a mail carrier, et cetera. Um, and the only other problem is, is it has to be picked up by midnight on the day of its delivery. So I'm so sorry. I've basically condemned you to have to go to the airport to pick up this package on the day. And I basically then of course was very self-deprecating and I don't know why I signed up for this, et cetera. And we made fun of the service. Why does this service exist, et cetera. But she was hooked. She, she believed me. So then what do I do? I download a burner phone app, which basically means it'll give you a fake phone number. And I compile, I write a text message that is written as though it's one of those automated texts. So it's in all caps and it's like freight ship service. Uh, would you like to receive text updates? Uh, reply yes. And then I waited because I had a giant response. Cause if anyone's used one of those services, as soon as you respond, yes, immediately you'll get a huge response every time. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, Mm -hmm. I have to be watching for her to make this response. Cause as soon as she does, I've got to send this to make it look real. Sure. It must've been 12 hours. (laughs) She has not said yes until finally we had recorded an episode of the show. And then I, I casually mentioned like, Oh, I, I got signed up for this 
text alert. And she was like, oh, me too. I, should I say yes? And I was like, well, I mean, if you want <laughs> in my mind, like, yes. And so then I, she does, I send the response and what do I do? Of course, I mess up the 24 hour time. So then I have to start sending like um, arrival time updates the next day. Cause I, I, I don't want to send an immediate, like, you know, I got to try and make it again, look plausible. Anyway, it told her that she needed two pieces of government issue photo ID in order to pick this up. It had a confirmation number. It had the exact weight of the package in both yeah. pounds and ounces. I also really did mail this package. So I took a, like a picture of that confirmation number and sent it to her. So again, I, I just feel like I covered all my bases. Then I let her know that it's like, when you arrive to the airport due to COVID-19, do not enter until you receive a text message telling you where to meet the agent, uh, the freight ship agent. And then of course, when I arrived, I was like, your package has arrived. Please meet the freight ship agent by uh, baggage carousel one. And then of course, when she came in, I was wearing a sweatshirt that said, happy birthday, Christy. I'm so sorry, I lied. <laughs> Yeah. I just yeah. think it was masterful work. It, it was was well done. Thank like you. It was like you should be a villain on a soap opera level. Like well, I or didn't someone see it who, coming. who runs a podcast uh, based in true crime. <laughs> yeah. I mean the joke is since then I've received a few texts from businesses that I've ordered from and I just went, "Well shit, now I don't trust them." <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've boy who cried wolf you. I'm so sorry. Oh, well, I commented to my husband. I was like, ah, how come this? Uh, I'm like, this is this is legit, isn't it? And he's like, I don't know. I think so. And I was like, well, I'm just I'm not going to respond. I'm going to make them come to me. <laughs> come to me. Yep. Well, yeah, it was listen. it was beautifully done because I never would have uh, seen that coming, especially I mean, you know, based on the sight of my home when you walked into it. I was not prepared for anybody. <laughs> well, I mean, you've seen yeah. the sight of my home when I have been prepared for your arrival and it was kind of along the same line. So <laughs> we're, we're good. We're good. Um, but yeah, that is the story. That is why this episode is a week late. We took a week off. It was much needed. It was wonderful and lovely. And, uh, but I'm excited to be back. Yes. I mean, we were, we had researched and we got to a point like I would have just needed like a few more days to finish those notes off and we could have recorded and I wasn't going to work on them while you were there. No, it we ended like up knee deep in things. And then, cause you never know what we're going to do. We, we will come up with plans of things we're going to do when we're together. We yeah. always have the list. We're like, we're going to watch this movie. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And then once we get together, the energy of the two of us combines and we're like, no, no, we're going to do this. I never in a million years would have thought we are going to open mystery mini brands. We're going to go to a store four separate times on a single day in the hopes that they've refilled the stock. They haven't. Calm down. Take a nap. Take but a nap. We, we were just so in it and so excited and we sought out other locations nearby that we could go to we're like should we drive to another town what are we gonna do we've got to keep finding these and uh it's like we we sold them out everywhere couldn't find them ran into a parent who just looked at us and went oh sold out everywhere right as though we were also purchasing these for children. And we just went, yeah, I know. Yeah, like yeah. We were, <laughs> he didn't have to know we felt that way for ourselves. Not his business. Yeah, not no, it's not. And the joke is I bought the store. I have not put it together yet because af as soon as she left, I was like, I got to get back to work, crack the books. So I prepare, finished preparing the notes for this evening. And my plan tomorrow, even though it's not going to be tomorrow for the people listening, I'm going to, I'm going to get in my bed. I'm going to put on a playlist of never ending Hallmark Christmas movies. And I'm going to put that store together and take a lot of breaks because I have a feeling it's going to be frustrated and the pieces aren't going to be right. And I'm going to be angry, but I'm going to put together that store. And so my goal is the next time we record one of those shelves back there is going to have a mini store on it. <laughs> and it's going to crack me up every single time I come in this room. I am yeah. so happy for you. 
Yeah. Uh, and I'm so happy that you have that for a beautiful birthday plan. That sounds wonderful. I can't wait. I get, we get a lot of a heat from some people that are like, how come you're not doing anything huge? And it's like, sometimes you just want to lay in bed. I, it should be noted. And I think I mentioned this last year when I first said I was jazzed. Um, when it comes to Hallmark Christmas movies, I know that people, I know they're predictable and I know that they're whatever, whatever, but they give me joy and it hurts no one. Uh, take whatever you find joy in. If it hurts no one, take your joy. Uh, and I, every year I, I have the list of the ones that come out. I watch as many as I can. I rate them so I know if I'm ever going to rewatch them. And I was to a point where I was watching like a hundred and some Christmas movies from November to the end of December. And I could not have been happier. I haven't watched a single one yet this year because I just haven't had the time. And so I'm going to take the time is my point. It's, I don't know how I'm going to narrow it down. I'm realizing now I was supposed to take the time today to make that playlist. So I remembered what I wanted to watch, but I may just have to go off the top of my head tomorrow. We'll see, but I can't wait to be knee deep in Hallmark. I can't wait for you for that either. I can't wait for that for you either. That doesn't sound right, but you know what I meant. You all well, know what I meant. Not unlike the Glee curse episode. It's a romp. Thank you very much. Um, I also just want to give one quick caveat. If this yeah. sounds weird, if my mic sounds weird to anybody, my clip that clips my microphone to my stand, to any stand, snapped in two. And let me tell you something, yeah. getting a replacement, virtually impossible to just get that one part, ordered some, didn't fit. So this episode is being recorded with my microphone being held up <laughs> by two true crime and cocktails blankets. Yep. And before we started, Christy said to me, oh, I like that you've wrapped it up like one of our blanket girls. And I said, yeah, well, this microphone is broken too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. anyway, bear with me. Again, rather than hold off any longer, yeah. uh, you know, we're making, we're getting by. I tried crazy glue. I tried a bunch of things. It's just a no-go, but it should be here before we record our next episode. So fingers crossed, we have no problems with that. <laughs> um, again, the hits just keep on coming. And, oh, and also I have a, a small dog in my lap. So if at any point there's weird shuffling, you hear weird snorting, um, it may be me, but it's probably the dog. <laughs> There is a great chance it could be me. I don't well, know. Who knows? Yeah. Um, final thing we need to cover before we get into it is what you're yeah. drinking over there. Uh, well, I'm doing a water, obviously, for hydration. Uh, and then I just decided, you know what? Just a Palm Bay. Just a nice, light, rainbow twist Palm Bay. Get it done. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Yeah. Dear listeners who are in Canada, and I apologize to the people in the U.S. because I'm one of you that can't do this on the regular. But while I was in Canada, I got mm -hmm. to try the Rainbow Twist Palm Bay. Now I've yeah. had the other flavors in the past when I lived there. The Rainbow Twist, we don't get paid by them. No. Again, this is just my opinion. Delicious. It's like yeah. a, it's like a, it's like a liquid candy, but not so sweet that you hate it. You know what I mean? Like it's just not so perfect. sweet. You can't do multiple. You can do multiple yeah. and I did. Um, <laughs> it was delicious. So I am a little envious of that, but I will say, what have I got going on over here? Oh, just yeah. a skinny Kimmy C. That's right. The 70 nice. calorie Kim Crawford, um, which again, not a bad drink. Also not paid by them, but I don't mind it. I don't mind the, the lower calorie, which again, not because I am suggesting anybody count calories. For sure. me, it's more because I drink a large volume. And it does the job just the same. <laughs> Look, I also really love Skinny Kimmy. I feel like Skinny that's, Kimmy. it's, it's, it's so, so close to being the perfect rhyme. And you, you know, I like a rhyme. Uh, I like alliteration. I just, my OCD likes things that make sense. <laughs> well, alliteration is your favorite literary device. It is. It is. Should people have favorite literary devices? No. Do I? Yes. I also love a good foreshadow, but that's not the point. 
I yeah, love like all of this. In a movie or a TV show, I have literally sat there, something happens, and then I go, oh, that's foreshadowing. <laughs> like, it's a problem. That's No, I take that back. It's not a problem. It hurts no one, and it brings me joy. There you that's go. where we're at. Just like yeah. something that brings me joy is the episode, The Glee Curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? I just, it, there's no real reason. I mean, I do think it is a romp and hilarious. And if you haven't listened to it, go back. But uh, it's just because I think I ended up inadvertently saying it in two different episodes. And then I thought, yeah. wouldn't it be funny if I started slipping it into every episode? But I'm going to have to get a little more sneaky if it's going to be a funny bit. You know, that's me explaining comedy. There you go. <laughs> what I, a D. What a D. I, look, you're of the two of us. You're the one who's taken classes. Listen, you're the one that's trained. Barely. I was trained in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. Those mean streets. You're in those comedy battles. I love it. I love it. Oh, I, I couldn't last in any sort of battle. But, no. well, I don't know. If I had to arm wrestle for a mini brand gold for you, I would do it. I just want to say, this is the last thing I want to say, and we'll get into it. I'm collecting the gold ones. She's collecting yeah. a different series. And at one point she got a gold one that I did not have. And she handed it to me and I looked at her and with eyes as big as saucers and completely earnestly, I went, yep. oh, wow. Like just <laughs> so shocked that she was being so generous. And like, I should be shocked. She's a, the most generous person I know, but it was just such a, again, that's just a taste of the true joy that was that afternoon. And then it should be, be noted also, when we got to the end of opening all of them, we were exhausted. <laughs> I, I like just, our fingers were so sore. Oh man. It, I didn't like, we also like, that was only half of what we opened. We also had mystery ornaments that oh that's a whole other story Listen, another listen. nightmare of things and it's just it again it hurt no one we helped the economy yes <laughs> and had so much fun and again every time i look at them i'm going to think of us yes and me unwrapping that tiny tiny package of hot dogs and you being so excited was that the one that you went oh that's a nice item I did. And then you handed it to me and I went, there's a weight to it. <laughs> there was. And that's the joke. Not only were we laughing, there was like so many things that would come out that were so earnest that then we would burst out laughing because we're like, what are we are doing? We? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was, it was so joyous and we did not get a lot of that in our childhood. So I think our inner not kids together. were like, yeah. Hey, here you go. Yeah. And I have since purchased just so many toys that people are like, what are you going to do with that? And I'm like, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I think it's cute. Do I need as many of the Back to the Future Playmobil sets as possible? The answer is no, but the answer is also somehow, yeah. <laughs> yep. I don't know. That's where I'm at. Because again, yep. once your inner child comes out and laughs for hours it's hard to put her back you know it is and god forbid god forbid you do yeah i'd like her to stay i'm not gonna put her in the shadows no more nobody puts your inner child in the corner <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh yeah. That, there are levels to that movie that are so much darker when you're an adult watching it than when you're a child in the 80s watching it oh yeah Oh yeah. Also another one, Saturday yeah. night fever. Oh, I that, that one for the first time. And I was like, good Lord. I thought this was just about a dance competition. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, ooh, but that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. We'll save that for, um, we'll save that for movie time with Lauren and Christy. <laughs> Again, there's going to be a day, maybe like a Patreon episode or something where we're just full Siskel and Ebert. We'll pick like one or two movies and we'll just go for it. And Siskel give our and true feelings on that movie. Siskel and Ebert, Statler and Ward Waldorf, <laughs> Christy and Lauren. I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. All right. Listen, 
This episode of the show, of course, we're talking about Evil Genius, which is, of course, the documentary series, mini series, I guess you could say, on Netflix. Uh, this one I was a huge fan of uh, when it first came out. Very compelling. Uh, a lot to get into, so I cannot wait to talk about it. But in case you aren't familiar, never fret. We're going to tell you about it right now. In August 2003, Brian Wells walked into a bank with a bomb hanging from his neck and demanded $250,000. Shortly after leaving the bank, the bomb detonated and Brian Wells was killed. After a tip about another crime in the area, police realized that the two cases were actually connected. The investigation led police to Marjorie Deal Armstrong, a local woman with a string of ex-boyfriends who all died under mysterious circumstances. Everyone involved with the bank heist claims that Marjorie was the brains of the outfit, but she insists that she's innocent. So was Marjorie really the mastermind behind the bank heist or was she being framed by her co-conspirators in exchange for a lighter sentence? And was Brian Wells really a hostage or was he in on the plan all along? Love it. It, I had not seen it until researching for it and what a ride. Every turn you think that's gonna happen, nope. I know. Nope. It's, it's been a lot. Uh, I also read a book uh, specifically about Marjorie. Oh, uh, and just learned today uh, to, while finishing up my notes that one of the gentlemen who wrote it is like an FBI agent who was on the show. And oh, wow. In the, in the case. And it was like, this, this is a good time. And this is why you don't sleep. You know, you just got, you got to get through four hours of an episode and then you got to read that book and then you got to get all those notes compiled, double check things online. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Uh, so we're just going to hope for the best that this is relatively organized. You never oh. cease to impress. Well, you, you are too kind. I don't know where this is going to go. Again, I finished this just hours ago and already my brain is like, no, nope, don't remember. So off the top, a quick disclaimer. Throughout this episode, I will be mentioning mental illness, eating disorders, suicide, and murder. I just want to give like an overarching trigger warning because I'm not going to think about it later. So just know, really, with all of our episodes, there's bound to be something. So tread lightly, you know? Yes. Uh, and I think this is the first time I've ever done this this quickly, but we're going to jump immediately into the case. I go back and forth later, but for now, we're going to get right into it. August 28th, 2003, at 2.28 p.m., a man named Brian Wells entered the PNC Bank in Erie, Pennsylvania. He was carrying a gun shaped like a cane and had a bomb strapped around his neck. Wells handed the bank teller a long note that explained that this was a robbery. The note was long, which was unusual for a bank robbery. It was like nine pages long. Usually a bank robbery, it's like, here's a, here's a note that's like, put the money in the bag. No one gets hurt, kind of, whatever. It did was she have to pages. read all nine pages? Like, did, well, how long did it one of the pages was specifically addressed to the bank manager. One was addressed to the police. Like, uh, they, it was, but it was very long-winded for its purpose. Uh, the note instructed the teller to, quote, gather employees with access codes to the vault and work fast to fill the bag with $250,000. It added, quote, you have 15 minutes. The teller informed Wells that there was no way for them to get into the vault at that time, so she was only able to fill the bag with $8,702. Wells grabbed a dum dum lollipop from the bank counter and left. Witnesses claim that Wells was swinging the cane around like Charlie Chaplin as he left. Wells got into his Geo Metro and drove to the McDonald's across the street. Spoiler alert, that's exactly where I would hit first after I robbed a bank. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I would ever rob a bank, but McDonald's is always somewhere on my to-do list. Uh, 15 minutes later, Wells was spotted by state troopers and was inevitably pulled over at the Eyeglass World which is located next to the McDonald's. Wells was removed from his vehicle and placed on the ground and his hands were handcuffed behind his back. 
Then Wells told the officer he was wearing a bomb. When they got closer, they noticed that they're under an oversized guest t-shirt. There was a metal device locked around Wells's neck. Wells said he was out on a pizza delivery. He was grabbed by a group of black men who locked the bomb around his neck at gunpoint and forced him to rob the bank. Police backed off, keeping themselves a safe distance away behind their vehicles. But the whole time, they kept their guns drawn, pointing at Wells, who just calmly sat cross-legged on the street beside his car. A TV crew arrived and started filming. The bomb squad was called in, but before they could arrive, the device started beeping. At the start of the sound, Wells became agitated. Moments later, the beeping sound increased and suddenly the device went off, causing a five-inch gash in Wells's chest. His time of death was 3.18 p.m. The bomb squad arrived on scene at 3.21. They inspected the remaining device as well as the victim's Geo Metro. When the police inspected his car, they found the two-foot-long cane gun and even more handwritten notes. One note was addressed to the bomb hostage and gave instructions for Wells to rob the bank and then follow a map that would lead him to the keys and combination codes needed to remove the collar bomb. The note stated, quote, there is only one way you can survive, and that is to cooperate completely. And, quote, act now, think later, or you will die. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, with Wells dead, officers tried to complete the scavenger hunt on their own. Wells's instructions told him, told them to, quote, exit the bank with the money and go to the McDonald's restaurant, which he did immediately after robbing the bank. His note instructed him to check the small drive through sign in the flower bed. Quote, by the sign, there is a rock with a note taped to the bottom. It has your next instructions. Those instructions turned out to be a two-page note, which sent him to a wooded area miles away where a container with orange tape would hold the next set of instructions. Wells, unfortunately, had not made it to that part of the hunt, so when police officers arrived, they found a note that sent them to a small road sign just two miles or 3.2 kilometers away where a jar would contain the next instructions. But when police arrived, the jar was empty. When investigators drove the route, they did so at the same time of day, same day of the week, under the same weather conditions as the day of the robbery. They determined that there was no way that Brian Wells would have been able to finish the route before the bomb went off. But the thing about this case is that there was not a lot of forensic evidence, so the investigation hit a standstill as there were no clues as to the identity of the perp who was now being known as the collar bomber. But one big clue uh, they had was the bomb itself. Now, right out the gate, I had some issues with this investigation. For one thing, when it came to the autopsy, the coroner made the choice to try and preserve what was left of the bomb, so he chose to cut off Brian Wells' head. It should be noted he did so without the consent of the Wells family, uh, but it just feels like an extreme choice. And I feel like no matter how they would have cut through the bomb to get it off, it I still feel it could have been done and still left them with what they needed. Like, I felt like this was a really unnecessary That's, move to make. Yeah, that feels really like desecrating a corpse or whatever the the charge yeah. is like it's not and the, right yes and the documentary the doctor was like it was done it was done gently peacefully gently like he was, yeah he was trying to make it seem like it it isn't as horrifying as it sounds and i'm like doctor it will always be horrifying to say that you've taken off someone's head yeah. Well, it's not typically done. I, I no. right. Like ever. I need to believe that it's, it was just, it felt like it was a choice and it was like, well, we're going to do this to preserve as much of the evidence as we can. And it's like, I still think there would have been another way, but okay. Uh, at a press conference, the FBI showed photos of both the collar bomb and the cane gun. The gun was made from wood and metal and was loaded. 
The bomb consisted of an iron box that contained two six inch pipe bombs and two sunbeam kitchen timers. The box was connected to a triple banded metal collar that featured a spinning three digit combination lock gears and four keyed brass locks. The collar was locked around Brian Wells' neck like a giant handcuff. When the device was inspected closer, there were warning labels written all over it that looked like the notes from the robbery. The warnings mentioned booby traps, but they all turned out to be red herrings. There were wires as well as a plastic cell phone that all did nothing. While the device appeared to be very complex, in the end, it was just simply two pipe bombs and two timers. Investigators believed that whoever made the bomb was patient, deceptive, secretive, and wanting to be in control. Profilers added that the bomb maker was mechanically inclined, frugal, and a pack rat with a hidden violent side. Oh, I love this profile. Well, there will be more, so brace can't wait the cane gun was made from a pipe there were firing instructions printed on the weapon it was designed to fire a single shotgun round so since the device didn't lead investigators to a suspect they started to look into the victim 46 year old brian douglas wells uh, worked as a pizza delivery person so the media started to refer to it as the pizza bomber case he was described as friendly kind-hearted and childlike he spent a lot of time with his mother, taking her to concerts and movies. He also loved scavenger hunts. Oh. There was one called the Great Key Hunt in his local newspaper where clues were printed every day that would lead to some sort of landmark. Since the entire heist involved an elaborate scavenger hunt, investigators started to wonder if the entire thing was made specifically with Brian Wells in mind. But since Wells was so incredibly calm throughout the robbery, investigators wondered if Wells was somehow involved and that maybe he simply didn't know the bomb was real. I'm more likely to believe that Wells wasn't involved in the planning at all, but that's a decision that each of us are going to come to on our own later in the program. Thank you. On the day of the bank robbery, Mama Mia's Pizzeria received a call at 1.30 p.m. The caller requested two small sausage and pepperoni pizzas to be delivered to a location just outside of town. The owner, who had answered the call, didn't understand the delivery instructions that the caller was giving, so he handed the phone off to an employee, Brian Wells. Wells wrote down the coordinates for the delivery and agreed to deliver it himself, even though his shift was ending. Wells left with the pizzas around 2 p.m. The coordinates given were with the order led to a TV transmission tower site in a wooded area near Peach Street. When police arrived at the area, they noted tire marks that matched Wells's car, as well as shoe prints that matched the footwear he was wearing that day. There were also scuff marks found at the scene as though some sort of scuffle had occurred, which led some credibility to Wells' story that he'd been grabbed by a group of men and forced to have the collar bomb put on. So the bank robbery happened August 28th. Three days later, on August 31st, a co-worker and friend of Brian Wells named Robert Panetti was found dead at his apartment. He had allegedly called 911 on Sunday morning saying he wasn't feeling well. However, he refused treatment, which makes me wonder why he bothered calling the paramedics to begin with. He was later found dead by his parents. The autopsy report concluded that the 43-year-old died from either an accidental overdose or suicide. Panetti had allegedly overdosed on a mixture of methadone and Xanax, which, according to FBI agent Jerry Clark, is known on the street as a hot shot. Oh. Yeah, which is basically just a way that uh, terrifying people poison people to just make them appear as though they have OD'd when they have not. Oh, really? It's like, I want to say spy level things, but it's like, that's how you get rid of people. Oh, yeah. God. It's horrifying when you look at the world. I mean, quick aside, we don't have time for it, but it's too late. Uh, I just read about a man who 
gave his wife a bowl of cereal that was laced with a lethal dose of heroin. And she suddenly wasn't feeling well and he helped her to bed. And the next morning she was still sleeping. So he just went to work and called a neighbor to check in on her. And the neighbor who also happened to be a nurse realized, oh, wow, she's not responsive. Something's wrong. Uh, they call an ambulance. Yeah, the woman's dead. Uh, and then police, they do an autopsy and they're like, oh, well, she OD'd. And the husband was like, oh, wow, this is, this is upsetting. And the, what the wife's family went, this is impossible. She wouldn't, she doesn't do drugs. She's not going to do heroin out of nowhere. And the husband went, ah, well, what are you going to do? Uh, and then five years go by. And then suddenly it's like, wait a minute, something's not right. They tested this. She was apparently breastfeeding their youngest child. They tested breast milk that she had stored in their freezer. Absolutely no signs of heroin in that. They realized the husband did it, looked into him. He'd been looking into women online. A woman (gasps) moved in less than a week after his wife died. He'd been sending thousands of text messages to this woman, planning a way to get out. They had two young children together, him and his wife, by the way. It has now come out again, this case, because he uh, was just found guilty of killing his wife. But it took, she died in 2014. It took till 2019 for her death to be considered a homicide. And if it hadn't been for that breast milk, he would have got away with it. Which is horrifying. But I was like, you just put so much heroin that you killed her and you don't even care. And you immediately had another woman move in. What does the other woman know? I can't even get into it. The point well, is, well, yeah, I, I, I just, I have so many questions, but I saw that and I screamed and then forced my, my husband to hear every detail I could about the case because I was just beside myself. But you know, there's a quick, uh, true crime side note. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Sometimes they're go. organic. They're just organic. They are. they are. We can't stop ourselves. True crime's our life now. Uh, after Brian's death, Panetti had become nervous and was worried that someone was coming for him. Investigators went to the pizza shop to interview Panetti, and he asked to move the interview to Monday. He was found dead on the Sunday. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, Floyd Stockton, who was involved in the robbery plot, and who we'll get into more later, once claimed that Panetti was at the tower location when the collar bomb was forced onto Wells. But again, we will get into that later. Uh, To this day, no one has been able to pinpoint whether or not there is an actual connection between Panetti's death and the bank robbery plot, which is just one of the many things that I find frustrating about this case. But spoiler alert, Panetti will be coming back to our story later on. On September 20th, three weeks after the heist, 911 operators received a call at 8.15 p.m. from a man who said, quote, at 8645 Peach Street in the garage, there is a frozen body. It's in the freezer in the garage. The caller said he was 59-year-old Bill Rothstein, and the address was his own. He added, quote, there is a woman that you might want to pick up and question. And that woman was Marjorie Deal Armstrong. When the operator asked Rothstein who Marjorie was to him, he said, quote, I helped her do stuff I shouldn't do, but I never killed anyone. So I just want that known. So before we get any further into this wild case, I want to talk about Marjorie for a bit because she is, for lack of better words, fascinating. Yeah. And I think on her, like understanding her background is important to this case and how everything came about. So Marjorie Eleanor Deal was born February 26, 1949 in Erie, Pennsylvania. Her parents, Harold and Agnes, married in August 1942 when Agnes was teaching high school and Harold was building locomotives for GE. Marjorie was an only child and perhaps due to that matured more quickly than typical kids her own age. For example, when Marjorie was eight, her favorite thing and the thing she was the most fixated on in the world was money. 
When Marjorie looked back fondly at time she spent with her grandparents, she described them as, quote, they handled money excellently. In her youth, Marjorie was a bright student, earning above average grades. At graduation, she was her class valedictorian. After high school, Marjorie went to Mercyhurst College, majoring in sociology and social work. In 1972, at the age of 23, Marjorie went to a therapist for the first time, saying, quote, something is wrong with my mind. She said that her parents, quote, spoiled her as a child, but then turned mean. And she described them both as having manic depressive episodes. According to authors Jerry Clark and Ed Palatella, uh, there was an, even an incident when Marjorie's father, Harold, allegedly went after his wife with a butcher knife and Marjorie stepped in between them. Ooh. Yeah. The therapist said that Marjorie had multiple symptoms of depression and that she was incapable of holding a job. Marjorie confided that she'd suffered from anorexia at the age of 12 and that at one point she had to be hospitalized when her weight dropped from 135 pounds down to 85. Marjorie blamed her parents for her disorder, saying that she felt pressured by her parents to perform and that she used the eating disorder to rebel against their expectations. Marjorie often said that Agnes used to blame Marjorie for all of her stretch marks. And a quick aside, the sooner we stop judging women's bodies, maybe the sooner they'll stop judging their own bodies and not make their children feel like shit for nothing. I guess I'm spicy today, but that's just where we're at. I like it. In later trials, one of the psychiatrists who treated Marjorie early on testified that she did in fact have an eating disorder, stating that Marjorie started plump, but quote, as she got older, she thinned out. And I know that I'm not a therapist, but to Dr. Robert L. Sadoff, I'd like to say Maybe it's a bad idea to use terms like plump and thin when speaking about a patient with an eating disorder. Maybe yep. I'm wrong, but maybe Dr. Sadoff needs to take a nap. I'd say at least that. And I go so far as to say is maybe have his uh, credentials taken a look at. Yeah. I need to believe that if he was practicing lo that long ago, I need to believe he's retired. I want to believe that. I have a lot you, of, you never know. He no. could be 123. I, if he ever comes up again in this show, I'll be enraged. <laughs> That's yep. fine. Uh, early on in her therapy, a psychologist said that Marjorie quote, showed self aggra aggrandizing thinking in that she exaggerated the degree to which others found her attractive and the degree to which she knew important people. Marjorie had told that therapist that she quote, used to be the prettiest girl in town. By 1975, Marjorie was working on her master's in education. She would later admit she wanted to become a teacher simply to please her mother. Between May 5th, 1976 and July 29th, 1977, Marjorie had 38 sessions with a therapist, which averages out to about 2.7 sessions per month. After Marjorie's husband died, she asked for a piece of his leg bone in case she'd be able to clone him in the future. So, and I mean, no shade by this whatsoever, but that is a woman that should be seeing a therapist more than two times a month. Oh gosh. I think once a week is average for many. Um, average is I know a relative term we are not yeah. supposed to necessarily use with, with therapy, but yeah, I'd say maybe kick them up for a bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm also realizing, I don't think I ever mentioned the leg bone again, but I just can't imagine, please, can I have a bone from my deceased loved one is a level that I don't understand. Again, no shade. She, uh, she had some problems. Uh, one therapist diagnosed Marjorie as bipolar and manic, while another therapist said Marjorie wasn't mentally ill at all. She was just a narcissist with a personality disorder. One doctor suggested that Marjorie had, quote, a deep-seated hatred of men. Marjorie absolutely denies that. When asked about her mental illness, Marjorie originally blamed her behavior on, quote, genetics and inconsistent treatment from her parents. 
In May 1985, Marjorie told a psychologist that she didn't use drugs or drink. But years later, she admitted to another doctor she had taken amphetamines, marijuana, and pain pills. She claimed she didn't drink at all, but then she admitted she was in a relationship where they would be drunk together every night. So Marjorie might also have issues with compulsive lying. But again, I'm not a doctor. Now, the big thing about Marjorie that our dear listeners are going to want to hear about is the fact that six men linked to either Marjorie or her crimes have died, and only one was from natural causes. It started on July 30th, 1984, when Marjorie shot her boyfriend, Robert Thomas, a 43-year-old Navy vet of the Vietnam War. The couple started dating in 1971. Thomas had a history of PTSD and schizophrenia with paranoid behavior. After six or seven months together, Marjorie and Thomas broke up. Uh, While Thomas was sleeping on the couch in the home that the couple shared, because apparently at some point they got back together, but I couldn't find out specifically when, Marjorie shot him six times. According to the coroner's report, the gunshots were so close that powder burns were visible around four holes in the shirt. There was also gunshot wounds behind his left ear and in his left wrist. It should be noted Marjorie bought the gun that she used to shoot Thomas shortly before his death, claiming she needed it for prowlers. Also, when purchasing the gun, Marjorie failed to disclose the fact that she had a mental illness, which would have made her ineligible to own a gun. Three days later, the police returned to the crime scene to secure evidence. However, their job was made more difficult by the fact that Marjorie was a hoarder. There was so much stuff filling every room of the house that it was considered almost uninhabitable. One of the bedrooms was full of clothing, books, paper, garbage, and roughly 600 wire hangers. Also in the house was an excessive amount of government surplus food. Marjorie would go to local food banks three to five times a week and tell them she needed food for her three children, who were 10, 8, and 7. Marjorie had no children. Speaking of children, side note, according to one source, Marjorie had a baby car seat in her car, even though she didn't have any children and she didn't know anyone that had any children. Was it a sign of potential mental illness? I don't know. I lean one way more than the other, but again, not a doctor. In July 1984, the food stored in Marjorie's home was valued at $9,890, which is equivalent to just over $26,000 in 2021. I won't get into all of the food that was found, but just to give you an idea, an official inventory count listed 389 pounds of butter, 727 pounds of cheese, 61 cans of fruit, 165 pounds of flour, 180 boxes of macaroni and cheese, 93 jars of honey, and 50 boxes of cornflakes. I'm also going to point out, I believe the nearly 400 pounds of butter was in the fridge, but the over 700 pounds of cheese was not. Four tons of food was sent to the dump. And I understand hoarding is a mental illness. I'm just so disappointed that food was taken from so many who could have genuinely used it. But of course, most of the food was rotting and the smell was so overwhelming. A police detective said, quote, rats were having a heyday. Oh, Mm. later, one of Marjorie's fiancés would tell the police that Marjorie hoarded items because her parents scrimped on toys when she was a child saying she would go around at night picking up things that people had thrown away and take them home. One time, she took home a dollhouse, even though it was missing a side. But if you ask Marjorie about the hoarding, she just considered it herself to be a collector and a connoisseur of fine items. Her exact wording was that she never owned junk. She only owned quality things. She said, quote, I had a lot of furs that were gifted to me, minks of all colors, white, yellow, every color. And then I had a black seal skin and all kind of rabbit coats. I had a lot of diamonds and a lot of precious jewels. After police went through her home, 
Marjorie estimated that they had removed 157,000 items from her home. After shooting Robert Thomas, Marjorie changed from her nightgown into a purple sweater and jeans, packed some grocery bags, and got into her 1974 Gremlin and drove to her parents' house. Marjorie was arrested for the murder of Robert Thomas, but she insisted, quote, I am not crazy or dangerous. I have a serious nervous condition, but need a chance. I want to lead a decent life. I have no criminal record. On August 27, 1984, Marjorie was released on $10,000 bail, which was paid by her father, Harold. Marjorie allegedly solicited an escaped convict to kill two people who refused to testify as her character witnesses uh, for her upcoming trial. Uh, phone calls between Marjorie and this alleged hitman were recorded. So Marjorie uh, then later said, well, the hitman was framing her. Uh, but, on, but because of that, on December 4th, 1984, at request of the prosecution, a judge signed a bench warrant to revoke Marjorie's bail and keep her in jail until the trial. January 3rd, 1985, Marjorie's bond was officially revoked and she was sent back to prison. April 3rd, 1985, Edwin Carey, Marjorie's paralegal, landlord, and occasional boyfriend, died by suicide. Edwin suffered from throat cancer, but some believe Edwin just didn't want to live without Marjorie. In court, Marjorie pleaded self-defense, claiming that Robert Thomas had been physically abusive towards her. In the end, Marjorie was acquitted, although she did receive probation for the firearms charge. After her acquittal, Marjorie said, quote, I've learned my lesson, I've done my time, and I'm not going to get into any more trouble. Then, in the summer of 1989, Marjorie met Richard Armstrong. On July 17, 1989, shortly after they met, Marjorie called the police on Armstrong, saying that he threw bricks at her and threatened to kill her, burn her car, and cause her permanent injury. The bricks allegedly dented and scratched Marjorie's car, and Armstrong was arrested. Then on April 27, 1990, Armstrong was arrested again when Marjorie accused him of hitting her in the face and threatening to mutilate her, kill her, and burn down her house. Armstrong pleaded no contest to the charge of harassment and the misdemeanor of making threats. He was sentenced to 30 days in the Erie County Prison, as well as two years probation. Something of note about Armstrong is that he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and had attempted suicide two decades before, which resulted in a four-month hospital stay. Armstrong had serious delusions, especially about germs, and was so scared that his food might be tainted that he often drank bleach with his meals. Yeah. On January 21st, 1991, Marjorie and Richard Armstrong got married. There's no record of where the ceremony took place, but Marjorie was listed as Armstrong's wife and the administrator of his estate, so we assume that the marriage was legit. On August 23rd, 1992, Armstrong became unwell and started to feel a terrible headache. He collapsed on the floor, hitting his head on the coffee table. When paramedics arrived, Armstrong was sitting against the couch and mentioned he had felt dizzy earlier in the afternoon. He was admitted at the ER at 3.50 p.m., and at the time, he was still conscious. The doctor on call believed Armstrong was suffering from a viral illness, but when Armstrong became unconscious and unresponsive around 7.30 p.m., the doctor ordered a CAT scan, which revealed that Armstrong was suffering from a hemorrhage to the cerebellum in the back of his brain. Armstrong fell into a coma and was officially declared brain dead hours later. Upon hearing the news, Marjorie asked that Armstrong be kept alive because she, quote, had serious plans of having the patient frozen in case there were medical breakthroughs in the future. So Armstrong was placed on a ventilator, but at 11.05 on August 24th, Armstrong's heart stopped and he was officially declared dead. He was just 44 years old. Because Armstrong died in a hospital setting, the coroner's office was not required to perform an autopsy, but Marjorie asked for one to be done anyway. The official cause of death was a stroke with marked swelling in the brain. 
1994, Marjorie filed a medical malpractice and wrongful death lawsuit against the hospital, St. Vincent Health Center, as well as several physicians. The suit claimed that the physicians failed to diagnose Armstrong's brain hemorrhage, which, if caught earlier, could have been properly treated. The case settled for $250,000 in November 1998. Marjorie's lawyer received about $75,000. She got the remaining $175,000. Marjorie was said to be distraught after Armstrong's death, saying Armstrong was her soulmate. She would later say the entire bank heist situation never would have happened if Armstrong had lived. But Marjorie did eventually move on. In 1993, while out on a date at a bar, Marjorie met 35-year-old James Roden. He approached Marjorie and asked if her and her date were married. Roden offered to buy them drinks, and the three of them hung out at the bar until 2 a.m. After that, Roden just kept showing up at Marjorie's house and calling her repeatedly. Marjorie learned that years before, Roden was in a tractor-trailer accident that caused him brain damage that left him prone to rage. But that didn't deter Marjorie. Oh, dear. Because when Roden showed up at Marjorie's house soon after with all his belongings, she let him move right in. Marjorie described it as, quote, he was kind of like a dog that followed me home. I don't like to put it that way. I'm not calling him a dog at that point. I call him a dog later on when I got to know him. And while their relationship started off positively, things quickly took a turn. In July 1994, police accused Roden of pushing Marjorie into the broken glass panel of a stove door, cutting her thigh. She required six stitches. Marjorie's father, Harold, paid the $250 bond for Roden, who pleaded guilty and was later sentenced to three months and a year of probation. At the time of his sentencing, Roden was already in prison for violating a restraining order that Marjorie had previously taken out on him. Marjorie claimed Roden had threatened to kill her and burn down her house. Deja vu side note. One thing that jumped out immediately to me is the fact that this is now the second relationship in a row where Marjorie claims the man in her life threatened to kill her and burn down her house. I'm not saying it didn't really happen. In fact, we have no way of knowing. I just find it to be a huge coincidence. Another coincidence, both James Roden and Richard Armstrong were people without housing when they first started relationships with Marjorie. In July 1995, Marjorie accused Roden of violating another restraining order by scratching and bruising her leg and again threatening to burn down her house. Roden was convicted and sentenced to six months in prison. The probation department made a note of their concerns about Marjorie, saying they considered her dangerous and that, quote, dealings with her have been far from pleasant. When Roden was released from prison, he moved back in with Marjorie. But this time, she converted the attic into a separate apartment for Roden to live in. Although from the sounds of it, it was done so that they could tell the welfare office that he was a tenant of hers, which would allow them both to receive government subsidies. If they lived together as companions, they would have only received one subsidy. Throughout Marjorie's tumultuous relationship with Roden, psychiatrists said that during her visits, Marjorie appeared to be calm and have her mania in check. But then on July 16, 2000, Marjorie's mother, Agnes, died at the age of 83. Agnes suffered from hypertension and her death was ruled a blood, a blood clot in her heart. Marjorie claimed that her mother's death was suspicious and blamed her father, Harold, for failing to ensure that Agnes was taking her medication. Marjorie said that her mother loved her, but she also pushed Marjorie to pursue an unattainable level of perfection. Agnes's estate was worth approximately $1.8 million, which Marjorie felt was her legacy. But since Harold was still alive and the beneficiary of Agnes's estate, it sparked a fight over Agnes's estate. Marjorie tried to get Harold removed as the administrator of Agnes's estate and replaced with a neutral party. Despite her best efforts, it didn't work. But in 2005, Harold wrote Marjorie out of the will. In 2010, Marjorie learned that Harold was suffering from dementia, so she petitioned to have her father declared mentally incapacitated and, quote, 
unable to manage his financial affairs. Throughout the legal process, Marjorie learned that her father's estate, which was once estimated at $1.8 million, was now about $185,000, as Harold was known for giving money away to any friends or family or neighbors who might need it. Marjorie referred to those people as vultures. Harold's original will left Marjorie $100,000, but when he disowned her in 2005, he still left her in the will somehow he had i don't know they say he disowned her but he left her supposedly two thousand dollars in the will the rest of it was meant to go to harold's friends and neighbors right harold deal died january 8th 2014 he was 95 years old the bulk of his estate went towards paying medical bills and marjorie never received a dime Marjorie also claimed that PNC Bank allowed Harold to access Agnes's safe deposit box the day after Agnes's death, and the bank didn't make any official inventory of the box's contents. The fight over the safe deposit box and its alleged contents sparked a deep-rooted anger towards PNC Bank, which I will remind you is the very same bank, very specific branch that Brian Wells robbed in August 2003. Investigators believe that Agnes's death and the court battles that followed is what shaped Marjorie's behavior in the pizza bomber case. Interesting. I mean, I think it's so interesting that she also was like, mom's dead. All of the money is mine. But her parents weren't divorced, right? Nope. Like they no, were they still weren't. together. They were. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, we are getting quite a picture painted of dear Marjorie and, yeah. uh, I just, I want to say I can't wait to hear what happens next, but I feel like that makes me sound like a monster. So I'm just going to say, let's get another drink. Let's hit the can, take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to hear more about evil genius on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, ready? Yep. One, two, three. Zoe, I scared the dog. Of course. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Of course, we are talking Evil Genius, the Netflix documentary. We were learning all about Marjorie Deal Armstrong before the break. And now we're going to learn a little bit more about this case that keeps taking twists that I did not see coming. It doesn't stop. No. It doesn't stop. In August 2003, Marjorie purchased a gun. And just like back in 1984, she failed to disclose her mental illness. Also like 1984, Marjorie also claimed she needed the gun in case of robbers and burglars. And that all feels like too much of a coincidence. Uh, Shortly after purchasing this second gun, and just three weeks before the bank robbery on August 10th, 2003, Marjorie shot and killed James Roden. But of course, at first, Marjorie denied being personally involved. But again, what are the odds that you're like, I need to buy this gun. I need it for prowlers. And then days later, you shoot your boyfriend. And the fact that it happened twice. Marjorie. Yeah, Marjorie. I could just say whatever people might believe. Uh, The body remained unmoved for two days. And remember, he was in an attic, and the outdoor temperature at the time was about 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. So I can't imagine that the smell was very pleasant. No. Not that Marjorie noticed, because after Roden's death, she moved into her car. Okay. When Marjorie finally decided to move the body, she called her former fiancé, Bill Rothstein. As a child, Rothstein grew up rich as his family owned the Rola Cola Bottling Company. However, he was teased horribly at school for being Jewish. Rothstein was described as highly intelligent, good with his hands, and he did odd jobs as an electrician, handyman, and substitute robotics teacher. It is said that Marjorie and Rothstein were, quote, so much alike as they were both highly intelligent, even brilliant, 
but they were also both condescending and arrogant and unwilling to accept that someone, anyone, could be smarter than they are. So Marjorie calls Rothstein to ask for help disposing of Roden's body. They wrap him up in a green tarp and place him in a freezer in Rothstein's garage, a freezer that Rothstein allegedly purchased specifically for this purpose. Rothstein even admitted to replacing a few stairs in the attic as they had blood on them. But then Rothstein claims that Marjorie started talking about disposing of the body completely by using a meat grinder or a wood chipper. Unsettled by the idea of destroying the corpse, Bill Rothstein called the police, gave them his address, and told him told them there was a body in the freezer. Rothstein said, quote, I wanted to help her because I thought maybe this will straighten her out because she was going to give up on guys because she kept going around with the wrong guys, she claimed. So I thought maybe I could help her out with this. Rothstein also agreed to dispose of the murder weapon. He used a reciprocating saw to cut up the Remington shotgun and then used an astaline torch to melt down the fragments. He then threw the scraps out his car window as he drove around town. History repeats itself. Side note, please. In 1979, Bill Rothstein testified at a murder trial that he had tried to burn a gun that his friend used to fatally shoot a man. The friend got in an, into an altercation with the man over his girlfriend. Rothstein testified he attempted to burn the gun, but was unsuccessful, so he threw it in the trash. When investigators found the body of James Roden, it was frozen solid and stuck to the side of the freezer. The entire freezer needed to be thawed out for several days in order to remove the body. And it took four days for the body to thaw before the coroner could do the autopsy. Rothstein told the police that he helped move the body, but that Marjorie Deal Armstrong was the murderer. Marjorie, of course, denied any wrongdoing and said that it was Rothstein who killed Roden to get him out of the way so that he could be with Marjorie again. Then she said that she was weak and went along with Rothstein's plan. Rothstein called the police a second time to ask if they had picked up Marjorie yet because he was terrified of her. He described Marjorie as extremely intelligent and manipulative. And after the police determined that James Roden was killed in Marjorie's house, Marjorie was arrested on September 2nd, 2003. She was charged with homicide, aggravated assault, possession of an instrument of crime, tampering with evidence, abuse of a corpse, and criminal conspiracy to tamper with evidence. And once again, when police entered Marjorie's home, uh, Marjorie was once again back to her old hoarding habits. There were cockroaches everywhere, feces on the floor, two dead cats, bags of garbage, broken furniture, and garbage covering the kitchen counters. There was even a baby carriage that was on top of a pile of garbage that was so high that the baby carriage nearly touched the ceiling. When authorities entered the home in 2003, they wore masks and full hazardous material suits. One police officer described it as, quote, I've dealt with corpses with the flesh falling off. This was worse. Wow. Yeah, that really painted a picture, I felt. Yeah, jeez. But the thing is, Rothstein's house was the exact same way. It was full of everything you could possibly imagine. And to that, I just want to point out that during the pizza bomber investigation, profilers believed the suspect was a pack rat which both Marjorie and Rothstein were. Coincidence? I think not, but we'll get into it. Despite admitting to helping move the body, Rothstein remained free on bail as he cooperated with the police during the investigation. On September 21st, 2003, Rothstein went to the police station to give an official statement about Marjorie. Rothstein said that he had known Marjorie for more than 30 years, and on the night of the murder, she called him to say her boyfriend Jim was dead and she needed help. Rothstein said he agreed to help her because he felt sorry for her, so Rothstein moved the body to his freezer. Then he claimed that Marjorie asked him to destroy the body, saying she told him to put it through a wood chipper. Rothstein refused, and that's how it came to be that he called the police. The thing about Rothstein that rubs me the wrong way 
During his initial interrogation, the very first thing he said to the FBI agent who was speaking to him was, quote, I'm the smartest man in this room. Which right out the gate, I, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> that was just, that's, that's interesting. It, it screams volumes about him right out the gate. Yeah. And more witnesses started to come out to say things uh, about Marjorie and James Roden and saying that things between them were volatile. Ken Barnes, who was a fishing buddy of Marjorie's, said that Marjorie and Roden fought all the time, including physical altercations. And Barnes' girlfriend, Agnes Owen, said Marjorie once asked Agnes how she could get rid of Roden. In January 2004, during the trial for Roden's murder, Marjorie never spoke in court. Bill Rothstein claimed that Marjorie shot Roden over money. In exchange for his testimony, Rothstein was charged with a misdemeanor of abuse of a corpse and was allowed out on bail throughout the trial. Marjorie threatened to sue, claiming that her attorneys were not certified. But then... As she was being led away from the courthouse past reporters, Marjorie said that not only did Bill Rothstein play a part in the murder of Roden, but Rothstein should be charged with the murder of Brian Wells. But wait a minute, what does Brian Wells have to do with the death of James Roden? Well, I'm glad you asked. As I mentioned earlier, Brian Wells robbed the bank wearing the collar bomb, and James Roden was shot and killed by Marjorie Deal Armstrong, for reasons that we don't know of yet. So during the investigation into James Roden's death, Bill Rothstein was overly helpful to the police. He told them whatever they wanted to know. He let them search his home. And during that search, investigators found a note that Rothstein had written. Prior to calling the police about Roden's body, Rothstein had attempted suicide. And since he seemed to hold on to everything, that note was found in his home. The note listed five things. It said, the body in the freezer in the garage is Jim Roden. I did not kill him nor participate in his death. My apologies to those who care for me or about me. I am sorry that I let them down. I am sorry to leave you this mess. But the very first thing listed on that note was, quote, this has nothing to do with the Wells case. And Ralstein, no one was saying that it did. So bringing it up is a huge red flag that these yeah. two cases are connected. Yeah. I should also point out that early in the Pizza Bomber case, profiler said the suspect was likely a pack rat and mechanically inclined. Rothstein was definitely like Marjorie in respect to having a hoarder mentality. Uh, but also Rothstein was mechanically inclined as he taught robotics as a substitute teacher and was known for being very adept at anything involving electronics. And then Marjorie starts to admit that, yes, she did, in fact, shoot James Roden, but she wasn't in her right mind when it happened. First, she claims she shot him because of a fight over another woman, and then she claimed he threatened to kill her. So she just had to defend herself. Which is interesting to me that she said the exact same thing the last time she was in court facing murder charges. Marjorie wrote a letter to the Pennsylvania State Police trying to bargain with them to get her to get them to move her to a prison closer to her hometown of Erie. She claimed that she had information about her fishing buddy Ken Barnes and that she could prove that Rothstein was involved in the Brian Wells case. Police arranged for a prison transfer, but Marjorie never gave any new information. She just kept insisting that Rothstein was involved in the bank robbery. Marjorie said, quote, it's not like we didn't measure his neck for the collar. Which stuck out to me like an admission that she was in on the whole thing. But of course, it was not an official confession. Right. Then on March 22nd, 2004, Marjorie was transferred from the Erie County Prison to Mayview State Hospital for long-term psychiatric evaluation. It is said that at first Marjorie refused medication and would just ramble throughout her interviews. When Marjorie was finally able to speak about Roden, she told doctors that Rothstein was responsible. But some of Marjorie's fellow inmates said that they witnessed Marjorie spending hours shaving off her eyebrows in order to appear mentally ill. 
So was Marjorie really struggling with her mental health or was she just a master manipulator? It could also be both. And while we're speaking about fellow inmates, three or four women who were serving time at the same prison as Marjorie said that Marjorie admitted to shooting James Roden because he was going to come forward about their plot to rob the bank. One specific inmate even took notes of everything that Marjorie told her and gave them to the FBI, who promptly put them in a file labeled snitch letters and shoved them in a drawer. Classy move, FBI. <laughs> snitch letters. Yeah. I, I want to have a drawer labeled snitch letters from now on. It feels right. Look, I'll buy you a desk if I need to so you can have the drawer. Thank you. Also, shout out to Harry Potter's The Snitch. Good for you. There is a golden snitch. It's the little, it's, it's the, it's what Hallmark mystery ornaments consider ultra rare. I remembered. Yeah, that's a throwback to our weekend together. Yep. Which makes us sound like lovers and I'm okay with it. It's fine. We toe a line. (laughs) We've been confused as a couple since high school yep when i bought whatever sandals and they (laughs) yep because you said you wanted them and i said well whatever my baby wants my baby gets and when we left the store we were like they thought we were a gay couple yep but they treated us so well and it was the 90s so good for them we were very happy about it listen (laughs) which you know what i could do a lot worse (laughs) same (laughs) come on oh lord so I also heard in the beginning stages of the bank plan, James Roden was possibly going to be a driver of some sort, and he was killed because he was going to the police. So investigators decide to go back through everything they had. They rewatched evidence videos, reread any interviews and reports, anything they had on the Brian Wells case. While watching a video of a walkthrough of Rothstein's house, they noticed a paper sitting on top of a desk that had an arrow on it that matched an arrow that was drawn on the bomb that killed Brian Wells. And while arrows tend to be fairly similar overall, this arrow was a very specific, really long, and then a slight 90 degree curve at the end. So it was a very specific arrow. So I agree it was the same. So investigators start to believe that Rothstein built the bomb and believe that he even disposed of the tools that he used to make it. And since Rothstein was extremely intelligent, disposing of the tools would make sense. And he admitted he once in the 70s tried to destroy a weapon for his friend. And he admitted he destroyed a weapon for Marjorie in 2003. Or sorry, when? Yeah. When was he killed? 2003? I've lost my mind. You knew what I meant. I do. Yeah. Uh, But even with similar arrows, there's still no physical evidence linking Bill Rothstein to the pizza bombing. In fact, the only physical evidence police had was the long-winded notes and what remained of the bomb. But then suddenly, Rothstein became unwell and was admitted to a hospital on July 23rd, 2004. It was determined he had terminal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he died just a week later, July 30th, at the age of 60. Even when he was questioned on his deathbed, Rothstein still never told the police anything about the pizza bomber case. It's wild that he all of a sudden had cancer and died a week later. Like, did he know prior to that and hit it? Like, that's crazy. I don't know. I I assume it's possible he knew and was like, you know what? I'm not going to spend my last months in jail. So I'm just going to forgive me, but dick the police around for as long as I can to, you know, I mean, unless this was a huge surprise for him, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, On January 7th, 2005, Marjorie pleaded guilty to the third degree murder of James Roden saying that her mental illness was at fault. She was sentenced to seven to 20 years. So March, 2005, A year since she was initially transferred, Marjorie was sent from Mayview to the Muncie State Correctional Institution. During a July 2005 FBI interview, Marjorie told investigators that in the summer of 2003, she gave Rothstein two kitchen timers after he asked for them. At this point, 
the information about the bomb specifically having two timers had not been made public. But Marjorie refused to give them any information about the bank robbery, possibly in an attempt to not implicate herself. So the FBI decided to go through the storage unit that housed all of the items from Marjorie's house. When the police went into Marjorie's house in 2003 during the investigation into Roden's death, all of the items from her house that were not rotten were put into a storage unit after her arrest. So the FBI went through everything and they found an angry letter that Marjorie had written to the PNC bank regarding her father accessing her mother's safe deposit box without her permission. The very branch of PNC that Marjorie was angry with was the exact one that Brian Wells robbed. I also love the idea that her father needed her permission to go to her to his wife's safe deposit box. It's like it doesn't work it doesn't like work that, that way. Marjorie. Yeah. No. Uh, so now investigators are starting to piece things together and it's becoming more and more likely that Marjorie was a big part in this robbery plot. But they needed witnesses who could corroborate Marjorie's involvement. Years before, when Marjorie was shouting at reporters that Rothstein should be charged with Brian Wells' death, she also told them that Rothstein had been harboring an FBI-wanted rapist in his house for almost two years. That rapist, oh, that's Floyd J. Stockton, a disgusting individual who was wanted in another state for the rape of a mentally handicapped teenage girl in Washington in 2002. Oh, my God. Yep. He... There was an arrest warrant. He fled the state and his good buddy, Bill Rothstein, helped him hide in his home. Ugh. The day after the bank robbery, Stockton suddenly moved out of Rothstein's house. Investigators interviewed Stockton on July 19th, 2005, while he was in prison for another rape charge. Stockton said that Marjorie and Rothstein concocted the bank robbery plan because they both needed money. Marjorie was allegedly getting money in order to pay Ken Barnes to murder her father, and Rothstein needed money to help with a family estate dispute. Rothstein was living in his childhood home since his parents' death years before. His siblings wanted to sell the house, but since Rothstein was living there rent-free, he wasn't interested in moving, so he told them he put the house on the market for $250,000, which he had not. But which was the exact amount they asked for in the bank robbery. On September 17th, 2005, America's Most Wanted aired an episode that featured Brian Wells. A UPS driver named Michael Vaught saw the show and called the FBI to say the day of the robbery, he saw Marjorie and a man fitting Bill Rothstein's description at a payphone at a shell station. And it just so happened the very payphone the police had determined made the original call to the pizza place that lured Brian Wells out to the TV tower was at that exact shell station. Whoa. Marjorie admitted to being at the shell station saying, quote, Bill was meeting me because he was my co-defendant in the Roden case. I'm an intelligent woman. I have the equivalent of five college degrees, top of my high school class, commencement speaker. I'm not a thief. I had money. No, she didn't. In the fall of 2005, the police interviewed Ken Barnes, who was not only friends with Marjorie Deal Armstrong, but was also familiar with Brian Wells. It turns out in life, Brian would often enjoy the company of sex workers, in particular, a woman named Jessica Hoopsick. According to Barnes, Wells used to drive Jessica to Barnes's house in order to buy drugs. Barnes not only admitted to knowing the victim, Brian Wells, but he also claimed that Marjorie solicited him to take part in the bank robbery and to kill her father. Allegedly, Marjorie wanted her father taken out so she could receive the rest of the inheritance that she felt was rightly hers. So she asked Barnes to kill her father, and he told her it would cost $250,000. But Marjorie didn't have that kind of money, so she helped create this elaborate heist. And isn't it interesting that the robbery letter asked for $250,000 and $250,000 keeps coming up time and time again as yeah. though someone's like, what's a large amount of money? And that's the, the amount that automatically comes to their minds. 
when Marjorie was told that Barnes said she asked to kill her, that he, she asked him to kill her father, she responded with, quote, I've killed two boyfriends in self-defense, but I've killed them. So why would I have to hire someone to kill my father? Wow. <laughs> because you did it in self-defense, allegedly. Allegedly. And like, oh, oh, Marjorie. On December 9th, 2005, Ken Barnes officially confessed to knowing about the bank robbery. He said on August 27th, the night before the robbery, he met with Marjorie, Rothstein, Stockton, and Wells to go over the plan. Barnes claims he was meant to be the lookout and that Marjorie picked him up on the day of the robbery. He asked about Roden and Marjorie told him Roden was sick. They went to the Shell station, then to Rothstein's house, and then to the tower location. The following is Ken Barnes' testimony regarding Brian Wells. Quote, when he came, he brought the pizza out that they ordered, and he set it on the hood of Bill's van. And then Stockton came out from behind the one building that was down there carrying the device. He brought it up towards Bill. And while Brian was looking at it, he got a look on his face. It was like, you know, I think at that point he realized this thing was real. Because as far as I knew, it wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to just be a gag, you know, to get the teller to give him money. Brian Wells turned to run. Bill fired a pistol in the air. At the same time, Mr. Panetti and Mr. Stockton tackled Brian and got him to the ground. Scuffling started to happen. By then, Marjorie and Bill were over, over beside. Marjorie was helping hold the device. Bill was strapping it on, on to Wells. He was yelling he didn't want to be part of this anymore. I walked over to him and punched him in the face. Not real hard, but just light. And I regret doing that because... Back then, I was just thinking of my own greed and about getting money. I really wasn't concerned for his health and safety at that point. One thing worth noting is that Ken Barnes is the only person involved in this robbery plot that ever mentions Robert Panetti. As you may recall, Panetti was the friend and co-worker of Brian Wells that was found dead from a possible accidental overdose three days after the robbery. So was Panetti really there? Or was Barnes lying to take some heat off himself? It's just no one else mentions him. And this guy mentions him. It's like, well, then it's, yeah, it's all connected, I guess. According to Barnes, Marjorie put the guest's shirt on top of the bomb and told Wells, if he gets caught, tell the police some black guys did this. Barnes oh. and Marjorie. Yeah. Barnes and Marjorie went to the Eaton Park, which is across the street from the McDonald's, and they sat in a vehicle and watched the entire robbery through binoculars. When the police showed up, they went to Rothstein's house and switched vehicles. Barnes said that as far as he knew, the bomb was meant to be fake. And while he agreed that they were all involved somehow, he said Marjorie was the mastermind behind it all. Marjorie denies all of this and claims Rothstein framed her. In the spring of 2006, investigators searched the home of Ken Barnes, and just like those of Marjorie and Rothstein, it was a hoarder's dream. And we're talking computer stuff piled everywhere, dog feces all over the place, and magazines that included articles on building electronics. On July 9th, 2007, after meeting for nearly two years regarding the pizza bomber case, a federal grand jury indicted Marjorie and Barnes on the felonies of armed bank robbery, conspiracy to commit armed bank robbery, and using a destructive device in a crime of violence. Rothstein and Wells were listed as co-conspirators. But of course, because they were dead, there was no point in indicting them. Two days later, Floyd Stockton agrees to an immunity deal with the FBI in exchange for testifying against Barnes and Marjorie. The thing is, I don't understand. Uh, Stockton admits he helped to lock the bomb around Wells's neck, and yet he got an immunity deal. I know the FBI was trying to focus on catching the bigger fish that was Marjorie, but the guy admitted he locked a bomb 
around another human being's neck and served no jail time whatsoever for that. Ken Barnes, who admitted he punched him in the face to kind of subdue him so they could put the lock, the bomb on him, served jail time. But not this other guy. I think they all should have been in jail, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. So in court, Stockton claimed that Rothstein ordered him to put the device on Wells. He testified he didn't know who wrote the notes or who built the bomb. The only thing he could give was the fact that, yes, Marjorie was at the tower site the day of the robbery. And I know I'm just nagging about it at this point, but that was the information that got him immunity? Was, yes, she was there and that's it? I just... Again, it just for some reason it's I gotta be in my bonnet about it. Well, especially considering, I mean, look, I know that you you have to look at each person in regards to each case specifically, but also yes. knowing his his uh, I don't know, rape history, it's yeah. also like, let's give this guy a break. Really? Like and I know that you're not supposed to be prejudicial and I know that I'm suggesting something that's illegal, but you know what I'm saying. It's just that it's like yeah. I guess what I'm, no, I take that back. I'm going to give myself an easier go. If it was somebody who was like an upstanding citizen who got himself into a bad situation, clean sure. record, had no priors. I don't know whether that, but, but again, it's like, to your point, he locked a bomb around a man's neck that eventually killed him. So that if nothing else, yeah, I think it's even higher than manslaughter technically you could argue and you know a good lawyer and again he has priors he has violent crime priors yep again twists and turns but also rage sweats ever so oh, rageful just... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god the amount of times we said ever so coolly <laughs> oh my god while we were know, together I... I just went to, oh, it's again, it's a twist off cap and I just went to, to twist it and it exploded. It, <laughs> the cap flew into the air. That feels like a good omen. Anyway. Well, that's, that's the rage energy that's coming from, that's, well, and, that's and coming it's, hard from the West. <laughs> and it's my second bottle. So yeah. get ready for more. Oh, I respect it. Uh, before I forget, because I haven't mentioned it yet, Rothstein's house, which was 8645 Peach Street, uh, where Roden's body was found in the freezer, the backyard of that house backs on to the TV tower location where the pizzas were to be delivered. So, again, didn't pick up on that earlier. Not blaming the police. I, I'm blaming a lot of other people. But July 29th, 2008, a judge rules Marjorie incompetent for trial based on her bipolar disorder. Leonard Ambrose, the lawyer who defended Marjorie during her 1984 trial, said he tried to have her committed four separate times, but each time she was deemed competent and released. He referred to Marjorie as his, quote, punishment on earth. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, September 3rd, 2008, Barnes pleads guilty to the felons, fel felonies of conspiracy to commit bank robbery and using a destructive device during a crime of violence. Three months later, Barnes is sentenced to 45 years in prison. Whoa. As he was 54 years old at the time, with no chance of leaving prison in his lifetime, Barnes agrees to testify against Marjorie. After months of medication and psychiatric treatment, Marjorie is officially found competent to stand trial in September 2009. In early 2010, Marjorie is diagnosed with cancer and has a lump removed from her neck. In August, a doctor's report lists Marjorie's life expectancy as three to seven years. The prosecutor wants to proceed with the trial and a court date is set for October 12th. During the nearly three-week trial, Jessica Hoopsick, the sex worker who knew Brian Wells testified that while at Ken Barnes' house buying drugs, she overheard people talking about a bank robbery. She said a woman was there, but she couldn't identify her specifically. Marjorie took the stand and cried, 
telling the jury about her abusive childhood in a classic move where the defendant uses tears to try and gain sympathy from the jury. If you're looking for an example of where that bullshit manipulation actually worked, you can look at the recent case of Kyle Rittenhouse. And now that I've said his name, I'd like to go on record as saying I will never say his name nor think of that asshat ever again. Yeah. I saw a good analogy, which was, uh, I jumped into a polar bear enclosure at the zoo and then I was, uh, felt the need to kill them when they, uh, yep. yeah, I have, <laughs> I'm not comparing so those many... people to polar bears. Nope. I'm just saying it's again, like you put yourself in a situation, but yeah. Oh, you know. I have so many rage thoughts about Kyle and I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for saying this, so I should stop saying it, but I'm going to, uh, because if you disagree with me on this, you probably shouldn't be listening to us anyway because you wouldn't agree with me on other things. Uh, I also, shame on his mother. Yes. She drove her minor child across state lines with an assault weapon and was like, just in case, so you're safe. That's not what he wanted it for, Ma. It's just so much of it angers me and him, the way he cried, the fact that anyone bought that, is wild to me because it was exactly, I love that I genuinely can't think of his name because I hate him too. Whoever, that ass hat from the Supreme Court who cried. Oh, Brent was, Kavanaugh. When he was like, I can't believe you're bringing up this stuff from my youth. It was, I don't remember. And it's like, well, you, you did some stuff, man. But- well, and if we're going to get into Brent Kavanaugh real quick, because that'll, <laughs> that'll fire me up. What I love, what I love is that the yeah. argument has been made for so many years by, I'll use your term, asshats, that women could never be presidents because they're too emotional. Yep. That women are too emotional. And when I watched that man give the performance he did during that interrogation or whatever you want to call it, I was like, how do we think that this is someone who can be impartial? Regardless of what you believe about politics, what regardless of what you believe to be true or false in terms of his history, what I saw was someone who was too emotional to be a judge there. I said it. I don't care. Come for me. I stand by it. I also believe that he's a piece of shit, but that's another, another story entirely. Yeah. And uh, just so you know, you come for her and you deal with me. <laughs> That's where we're out. Uh, I just anyone who disagrees that those two men are not pieces of shit. Come on, come on. Yep. So unlike that trial, yeah. On November first, twenty ten, after deliberating for eleven hours and thirty minutes, the jury convicted Marjorie on the charges of armed bank robbery, conspiracy to commit armed bank robbery, and using a destructive device in a crime of violence. On February 28th, 2011, during the sentence hearing, the judge spoke about Marjorie's long history with mental illness, saying, quote, there are people with these conditions who do not solicit others to kill their father or shoot someone in cold blood to silence a perceived threat or seal a man's fate by strapping a ticking bomb to his chest. Marjorie was sentenced to life in federal prison plus 30 years. So now... We've reached the portion of our program. Sorry, program. Thank you. I like to give an update as to where the characters from this story are today. While incarcerated, Marjorie Deal Armstrong died of breast cancer on April 4th, 2017. She was buried in an unmarked grave near a federal prison in Texas. Right up till the end, Marjorie always denied having any involvement in the death of Brian Wells. She said, quote, I'm a good, decent person. I've got the equivalent of five college degrees. I have a master's degree. I'm a certified teacher. I'm a music teacher. I'm a social science teacher. I worked at these jobs. I worked with the state. I have a degree in sociology. I'm not a bank robber. I don't have to rob banks to get money. I'm a certified guidance counselor. I almost have a doctorate. I am a certified to counsel elementary and secondary schools. I'm not crazed. I'm not a crazy person. Marjorie continued, quote, what I'm trying to say is I've had mental problems. I haven't made the best choices. I've made mistakes and I'm paying for them. What I've done wrong in my life, I will admit to, but I'll be damned if I'm going to take the heat for those who killed this guy. 
I will get into her momentarily. Yeah. Uh, in August 2017, a man claiming to be the common law husband of Marjorie filed a petition to claim Marjorie's ashes. Mark Marvin of Walden, New York, said he is a Quaker and that since Marjorie is also a Quaker, she should be buried in a Quaker cemetery near him in New York. In February 2020, Marvin was still trying to gain access to Marjorie's remains. His appeals have so far been rejected five separate times. Marvin has chosen to represent himself at all of these proceedings. There is no evidence that Marvin and Marjorie were ever married. In fact, there's no evidence that they ever met or communicated in any way. But Marvin refers to Marjorie as, quote, Mrs. Marvin. Oh, God. Des despite a lack of evidence, Mark, Mark Marvin, who is in his 60s, claimed that they married in a Quaker ceremony while she was in prison and that as his spouse, he's entitled to her remains. Although at one point in court, Marvin questioned whether or not Marjorie was actually dead. And if Marvin's story wasn't odd enough, he admitted to the court he plans to dig her grave by hand so it'd be ideal if her remains could come home before summer heat takes in. The case just never stops. Why doesn't he, can he at least use a, like a shovel? Like, does it have to be by hand? <laughs> just, or does he mean by hand with a shovel? Because I feel like I, there's a... I need to believe that's what he means, but I can't guarantee it. He is something else. Yeah. I just love that. It's like, there's no proof that you ever knew her, but she was your wife and he's paying all these legal fees to, to fight, to get her ashes. Uh, Floyd Stockton was released after serving time for the rape charge. Oh. And as of, as of 2018, he was living in Washington state, North of Seattle. The man who admitted to locking a bomb around another man's neck, He's just out there living his life, living back in Washington now that that arrest warrant is done because he's served that time. Ken Barnes remains in prison, but he honestly prefers it that way, as he said it has helped him with his substance abuse issues. He's expected to be released from prison September 10th, 2027. And for those following along at home, yes, Barnes was originally sentenced to 45 years, but after agreeing to testify against Marjorie, his sentence was reduced to 20 years. Jessica Hoopsick uh, has since confessed that when she was at Ken Barnes' house, she heard them talking about the bank robbery and that Barnes asked her to find a gopher who could rob the bank. They wanted someone that could be scared into doing it, who wouldn't go to the cops. Jessica said she was paid $5,000 to find someone, and she suggested Brian Wells because she felt he was a pushover. Oh. Jessica admitted to introducing Wells to Barnes. She said that Marjorie paid her $1,500 for Wells' work schedule. Jessica said the robbery was meant to happen the second week of August, but it was canceled because Marjorie had somewhere else to be. What a coincidence that about that same time, James Roden was murdered. Could yeah. that be her something else she had to do? Regarding the meeting that happened the day before the robbery, Jessica claims that Brian Wells was with her that day from 12 to 2.30 p.m. and that he worked at 4 p.m. so there was no way he could have attended the meeting. Ken Barnes says that Jessica's lying. But of course Barnes wants to paint Jessica as a liar he needs people to continue to believe that Brian Wells was involved in the robbery plot. There is no statute on, of limitations on murder in Pennsylvania. So if it's proven that Brian Wells wasn't involved in planning the robbery, his case turns into a homicide. So Ken Barnes and Floyd Stockton don't want anyone to say that Wells wasn't involved because they're the only people from this plot who are alive and could both face murder charges. According to FBI agent Jerry Clark, who has worked the case from day one and has even co-authored a book about it called Mania and Marjorie Deal Armstrong, he believes Marjorie was the one who came up with the idea of a bank robbery so she could pay Ken Barnes to kill her father. However, Clark believes the idea was Marjorie's 
but the planning of the robbery and the designing of the bomb and the entire scavenger hunt were all Rothstein's idea. He even believes that Rothstein personally built the bomb and that overall Bill Rothstein was the mastermind of the heist. And to say, to that I say, I know that Rothstein died early on in the investigation, but I can't believe he worked with the police on this and they pushed so hard to prove that Marjorie was the mastermind when in the end it's likely that Rothstein was the mastermind. He spent his final months free because he convinced police he wasn't involved. And just to clarify, I don't think Marjorie was innocent. She has done a lot of bad things in her life, and she deserved to spend time in jail for her crimes. But I just find it wild that investigators all but ignored Rothstein's potential involvement because they had blinders on for Marjorie. Clark also believes that Brian Wells was a willing participant in the robbery, while Wells' family, of course, believe that Brian Wells was an innocent victim. Regardless as to what the truth may be, the pizza bomber case is now considered closed. Well, the FBI considers it closed. Christy Oxborough does not. Yes. I just feel that there are so many questions that weren't successfully answered for me, which brings me to a section that I've simply entitled things that don't sit right with me. (laughs) When Brian Wells first mentioned the bomb and the police called in the bomb squad, why didn't they also call in an ambulance just in case? just to have one on standby in case the device did detonate because it did. Also, once the police realized there was a potential bomb, why didn't they try to put one of those police vests between the bomb and the victim? I'm not saying it would have saved his life, but wasn't it worth a shot? Maybe their instinct was to get as far away from him as possible and not go near him until the bomb squad arrived. But again, I'm just saying I felt something could have been done. And then after the bomb squad came in and cleared the scene, why didn't the police attempt to move vehicles or do something to block the public's view from Brian Wells' body? Because there were cameras and people all lined up. And at one point, he's like, I've seen photos and video footage of him basically laying there dead in his underwear. It's like, how about we have some respect for that? Uh, Speaking of not having respect for it, why on earth did the coroner make the decision to cut off Brian's head? I know they wanted the device for evidence, but despite how many times in the doc that that coroner said he was beheaded very gently, I just felt it was unnecessary. Also, how much was Brian Wells involved? If he was in on it, I don't think he knew the bomb was real. I don't think anyone could have been that calm walking around with a live bomb. And the marks of a scuffle at the tower makes me think that Brian wasn't in on it. But at the bank, he felt like he was getting away with it, so he had a calm demeanor. I don't think he willingly let them place the bomb on him, regardless as to whether or not he thought it was real. And then there's Robert Panetti. Was he involved somehow? The timing of his death is suspect, and the fact that his death could easily have been a cover-up. But why would he have been killed? What part did he play? Was Barnes telling the truth that Panetti was there for the meeting the day before the robbery? And assuming that Barnes and Stockton were telling the truth when they told investigators the original plan that the bomb was not going to be real, whose idea was it to make the bomb real? I think it just had to look like a bomb and the bank would have given up the money. Making the bomb live and making the scavenger hunt impossible for Wells to finish before the timers run out is premeditated murder, and I stand by it. But despite my questions, the only surviving members of the heist plot aren't about to talk, so sadly, I don't think we'll ever truly get the answers that we're looking for, and that burns me in a way you'll never know. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough. Wow. I mean, I am into this. I have taken extensive notes. Now I just have, I've, I've, I've graduated to just a dedicated notebook 
because this is going to make it easier to keep track of my notes, the chaos. And you, and you know what? That's going to be a real treasure. You're going to want to keep. Want to keep and like, I a, thought, like a scrapbook of our journey together. <laughs> get out of my head. I thought the same thing. I was like, why don't you have a dedicated notebook? Anyway, let's take one more break. Get one more drink. Hit the can again if you need to. And we're going to come back and you're going to hear about my dedicated notes and my dedicated <laughs> notebook when we come back on this episode discussing evil genius on True Crime and Cocktails. Okay. Last clap on three. Yeah. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing evil genius. Christy brought up some extremely good points before the break. I'm going to go back to the beginning, though, because, again, yeah. now I've got a notebook. We're going to go in order, and it's not going to be as chaotic as oh. normal, which is a travesty on some levels, but ultimately less stressful for me. So the image of the dum-dum and him <laughs> swinging that cane. But I am. I love that I just said I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'm going to jump around. If he was in on it, yeah. why wouldn't, okay, if he was in on it and the whole yeah. bit is you've got a bomb around your neck, whether he thinks it's real or not, yeah. why wouldn't the bit have been for him to play scared? It doesn't make any sense for him if he's in on it to yeah. go in and be so confident. Then what? Then it's just like, what is this situation? What is, you know what I mean? Like to me, it's just like, it only makes sense that he wasn't in on it if yeah. he, and then potentially, again, thought it wasn't a real bomb. And great point, by the way, the bomb absolutely didn't need to be real for this whole thing to get pulled off. Um, yeah. It definitely feels like someone who's trying to play God. It definitely feels like someone who thinks they're smarter than everybody, which we know is a, both a trait that uh, Marjorie and Bill possess. Mm. Um it means it also felt like someone who, and I'll say it, it felt like a, a Saw movie. It felt like Jigsaw. Yeah. Like this definitely felt like someone who was maybe trying to emulate that kind of like, oh, look how clever I am. Look at this grand plan I've schemed, you know? That, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And when you, when you said, if he's in on it, why wouldn't he play scared? Yeah. You play scared. So in the end, you can be like, I was just an innocent victim in this. This wasn't me. You don't start dancing around like Charlie Chaplin with a cane and yeah. taking a dum-dum. Like to me, that's that's somebody who's uncomfortable because they're they don't know how to act. And I'm yes. not making I'm not making fun of him. I'm genuinely saying I think that he didn't know how to act. I think if he was yeah. in on it, it would have made only made sense for him to pretend to be terrified again that there was a quote bomb around his neck. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, the autopsy, him getting his, the coroner, cutting his head off. I will just put out there once again, if you are a young person looking for a vocation and you'd like to consider becoming a medical examiner, there is a shortage in this country. And it's stories like this that make us realize just how important it is. It's a lot of schooling, doesn't pay well, but we will attend your graduation. <laughs> so just know the offer remains on the table. Yeah. Um, I'm getting more and more passionate about it by the day to the yeah. point that I want to try and change legislation to try and get medical examiners paid more because I actually think it's really, really important based on what we're learning week after week. Yep. Yeah. I can't okay. wait to see the scrapbook of you going to Congress. <laughs> about I it. wouldn't I, do it. I Honestly, I feel like if we got together a bunch of the big true crime podcasts and we said, like, listen, like, this is something that comes up, all jokes aside, that it's like, there's a problem here. These people need to be getting paid more money. They, they're, they, there's a whole bunch of training. There's a whole bunch of issue that they have to be, you know, in some counties, chosen, elected, et cetera. It's like, let's get some impartial medical examiners. Let's get them paid. And let's get beautiful, bright young people doing these jobs so that we can bring families mm -hmm. justice. Good God. Um, you're going to love this note. Two small sausage and pepperoni pizzas? Why not just order a large? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the specific of that. Yeah, I don't know. I, like, I guess maybe it's a two for one situation, but then I, to that I would say, maybe, like, does yeah. it have to be the same pizza twice? Like you didn't want to, variety is the spice of life. I know that's not the point, but I love that that did, that did bump me. I was like, that's weird. 
it is. And then now that we've said it out loud, I'm like, was that the code for somebody in the pizza place that was like, nobody orders two small sausage and pepperoni. (laughs) Forgive me if you do. You like what you like. My point is, is that, is it an odd enough choice that if someone working at that store, whether the owner is potentially involved, I'm not saying he is allegedly, uh, or if Robert Panetti was there or something, they hear it's an order for two small sausage and pepperoni. Is that the like, okay, it's on. It feels like it's odd enough. Yes, but it's not so weird. Like it's like anchovies and pineapple. Like it feels like it could be. Oh, but salty and sweet. Sounds delicious. I do not. I do not want an anchovy anywhere near my pizza. Never say never. That's all I'm going to say. Never say never. Oh no. You might be surprised. Well, we're going to drunkenly try it. Yep. And you're going to be like, I don't hate it. Anyway. Um, hot shots are going to haunt my nightmares. Just yep. know that. Yep. That's awful. It does seem interesting to me, bringing up Robert Panetti and the fact that it's like, is he involved or is he not? Why was he so nervous after Brian's death if he wasn't involved? That yeah. doesn't make any sense to the point that he's calling the cops because he's terrified for his life. Yeah. And then he ends up dead. That does say to me, I do feel like there is a very large possibility that he was involved in some way. Oh, agreed. Um, now, you'll love this. Marjorie, only child, valedictorian, got into therapy young. I was like, this better turn soon because there's some <laughs> real, real parallels with old Ash here. She um, didn't win a math award. Thank you very much. No, no, then it all, of course, tur- turned, but I was just yeah. like, there's a lot of comparisons here. Yeah. Um, and I don't, don't need that. Don't need that. No. Uh whatsoever um my god so many things about her story are fascinating the ways that her um mental issues uh present are fascinating to me and i could do an entire series of a podcast just talking about that but i know yeah. you know we, we we can't we're on a we're on some sort of timeline here but anyway um then this is the next the next thing i wrote down which i think you're really going to enjoy yeah okay so wait <laughs> charged with possession of an instrument of crime like my ass because this booty should be illegal baby that is so close to the brooklyn 99 because you because your ass is de bomb it was very oh it was i didn't even think about that i like it it was um funny and accurate thank you kindly now we're going to get into bill for a second here yeah, the fact that he matches the profile with the fa- the, the hoarding, the the mechanical experience, him being so smart, him being cocky, it yeah. is very interesting to me that they found each other. And it's very interesting to me that they had a relationship with each other because people who, I, I mean, listen, and I know that, I know that lots of people could tell me that I'm wrong. However, I do think that people who have that strong a personality, I think it is yeah. rare for them to, to, have long-term relationships albeit friendship or or romantic now granted she she was you know in other relationships with people who weren't as much like that which makes more sense to me but the two of them being so similar in those ways is just fascinating um again bill's note this has nothing to do with the wells case no one said anything that is again all signs Mm -hmm. point to and do we believe i believe that Marjorie was a very intelligent woman. Sure. I get it. Do I believe that she would have the wherewithal to build a neck bomb? Did she have that kind of mechanical experience? I mean, I thought that most of her schooling, although she says she's had lots more schooling than I think she actually has. Sure. Was in, you know, things like social work, teaching those, yep. That kind of avenue, whereas we know that Bill was an expert in robotics, an expert in electronics. Yeah. I just don't know that I believe that she took blowtorch to metal. Do you know what I mean? Like, it may have been her yeah. idea, but it does feel like I just think it's doubtful that she had that skill set. Yeah. I am not saying that a woman can't. I am saying that that woman, I don't think did, to be clear. I um, agree. And I... it. It burns me 
inside to think that the police put out like a, well, this is the profile we think that the suspect is. And he's exactly the guy that we're talking to, but that guy's not, not connected. I know. Like, how is that? Okay. It, it, it just feels again to me like they, they were both involved. It just feels like yes. it was, I agree. It was probably her idea. Do I think that she, impl- that she was the one that came up with the schematics and built the machine and all of that? I don't, but again, no. speculating. Yeah. Um, the fact that she told police she gave him two kitchen timers before that was public information. That feels like something. It also feels mm-hmm. like, again, she was giving him parts. Yep. Just saying. Um, also, Floyd Stockton, if I could take a page from Christy Oxborough's book for a second, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You real piece of garbage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, here is the big question that I have. Yeah. $250,000 is their goal. We know that, but then here's what my question is. Let's say for argument's sake that Panetti and Brian are both involved for this argument for a second. Sure. If Panetti and Brian are both involved, that brings the number of people involved in this to six. Stockton, Marjorie, Panetti, Bill, Brian, Ken Barnes. Yeah, six people. We've established that Ken Barnes was asking 250000 to kill Marjorie's dad. Yeah. So how is this money split going to go between these six people if this 250000 is intended to be going to Ken? Were they just going to kill the other four? I mean, we already know that they basically had the intention to kill Brian because the bomb would have gone off before he could finish the scavenger hunt. Yeah. Were they just going to take out the others? I mean, I think that seems more than possible but then also to her point kind of then why wouldn't they have just killed her dad yeah i just getting a weirdly elaborate and convoluted like were you getting the two hundred and fifty thousand to give to ken barnes and then he would kill your dad and then you'd split the million dollars that you think is the estate is worth because that's, but like, that's a huge investment for all of these people. Where is she getting the $5,000 to pay Jessica? There's a lot of questions. I mean, again, Marjorie was very like, oh, I have money. I'm good. I don't need anything. And it's like, oh, I, I don't think that's true. Yeah. But I don't know. It, it, that just seemed like, that just bumped me. That it was like, why are all of these willing participants taking part in this for essentially IOUs. Yeah. A lot of the time, I mean, again, I'm not basing this on anything other than what we know from the work we've done. People sure. tend to like their money for crimes up front if they're going to help you commit them and yeah. they're not a direct relative or friend of yours. Like, it's just odd to me. Again, like, what does this look like? And I, I hear you, but then... How much are these people asking for? And then how much is that dipping into this money that she's going to get from her father, which we already know had been reduced. And she had to have known that that money would have been reduced to that point. She may not have known by how much, but there's, she she had to have known she was not getting 1.8 million at that time. You would think so. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, I mean, again, I just, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to think too that Jessica could have potentially set Brian up as this patsy. It it does feel to me like, why aren't we believing her? She didn't come out and say it at the beginning. Clearly she was scared. She's come out with this later. To me, that lines up with his behavior because I don't buy that if he was in on it, he would have acted like that. Um, and, And yeah, to your point, there is a very vested reason for Ken Barnes and uh, Floyd Stockton to not want it to come out that he wasn't involved because then it's a homicide. And then we got another case. Then we got another, another trial yeah. potentially, which is again, wild. And also again, shame on her for setting him up because mm. she knew that he was so like kind hearted and stuff. I yeah. get it. You, you needed the money or wanted the money, but shame on her. That's, mm. that's sad to me. Um, 
because again, we know that they had a long-standing relationship too. So it's clear yes. that he he tr- he obviously trusted her to some extent, and that's oh yeah, sad. Um, uh, questions by CO was what I n- labeled your last section there, where I thought you brought forth so Thank many you. great questions. Um, again, why I just wrote down whose idea was it to make the bomb real? You're so right. It, it just feels again, like so many, I think the one thing that we have learned doing this show for over a year now, which again, in the grand scheme of the true crime world is not a long time, but we've spent a long, we've spent a long time with these things. Yes. It's just wild. What are the common denominators we always see? Lack of evidence, evidence being lost, things being bungled. Like these are the, the number one things that we see over and over and over again. And that's probably why those are the cases that end up getting talked about a lot because why wouldn't they be? Um, but rarely do you hear about a coroner cutting off a head mixed with that. You know, it just feels like this was so many. Yeah. It was like the, the the worst kind of synchronicity. It feels like there was so many things that kind of had stars that had to align in, in a in a bad way because it does feel also like why wasn't the ambulance called? Why wasn't that vest put on him? Why weren't they trying to protect his very, for lack of a better term, there was there was no decorum for that man. They kept guns drawn on him the whole time he was sitting there. So what was that? Was that fear? Was that confusion? Was that chaos? You know, and then, of course, my question always is, did someone there know? Like, you know, and I don't think that there w- there was nothing that they would have gained from that. So I don't feel like that's the case. But it just feels, again, like there was just so many things that had to go wrong and so many things yeah. that had to go right. Um, it's just such a sad, bizarre story. And the yeah. characters involved, again, the fact that someone like Marjorie would meet someone like Bill and the fact that you know, when when you when you bring forth a woman who had this this idea, which was either brought on by anger, resentment, et cetera, or mental health struggles, you know, it, it's interesting for her to be faced with somebody that could bring that idea f- to fruition and that he potentially Bill potentially is the one that took it to the next level and was like, not only are we going to do this, I'm going to make a neck bomb. And not only am I going to make the neck bomb, I'm going to make it real. And not only am I going to do that, but we're going to make a scavenger hunt that's going to be unsolvable, like a movie, like Jigsaw yeah. from Saw. It's chilling. The whole thing, top to bottom, chilling. I just thought of something. So he gets the money. They know that he'll never get to the end of it to f- remove the bomb in time. What if he's got the money with him when the bomb goes off. What's that then? Then you've done it all for nothing. Was this not about money? Was this just like a game that you were playing? I mean, that starts to feel like something that also is starting to make a little bit more sense to me only in it doesn't make, it it doesn't make sense to me. Also think about, here's another question for you then. These are people that have gone to the trouble of making this elaborate, again, saw movie level, four padlocks, a combination lock, two pipe bombs around his neck, a a nine page letter, a, a scavenger hunt going place to place to place. But they didn't think to do any research about what time of day or who is needed to open the vault. Yeah, what we're saying is we don't think they case the joint. Right. Which is, isn't that like 101 robbery? <laughs> like I think typically, yeah. Again, like to me, it's just, why was there so much being put on the grift or whatever yeah. you want to call it? Because to your point, again, it didn't need to be a working bomb, but there was sure a lot of care being made to make sure it was. And to make sure that this entire, again, flowery story made sense. Yeah. But there was no checks and balances being made to actually make it ensure that he could obtain the money that they wanted and that it could get to them without being blown to smithereens. Yeah. Well, it does start to put it in a new light. I, I do think that that is a really interesting theory, that it does start to put it in a new light, that it was like, 
what if, again, we're just completely whiteboarding, speculating here, but what if this was something much darker, that this was just a game? I mean, do we really buy, I'll go there for another second. Do we really yeah. buy that out of nowhere, Bill's like, yeah, I'll help you hide a body out of nowhere. Sure. Out of nowhere. Well, I wanted to help get her to get her back on the same path. Really? Or was this part of, again, what I'm saying is it's rare for two people who are so similar mm -hmm. with these delusions of grandeur, with the hoarding uh, tendencies, with, um, you know, again, their extreme intelligence, all of the above. What happens when two people like that get together? That also may both be struggling with mental health situations. What happens then? Does it become a game or does it become something where it's not even necessarily a game that might be the right term, wrong terminology to use, but they're feeding each other into this kind of delusion that unfortunately they had the goods to make good on. He had the, the know-how to actually make it happen. It's possible. And that it was part of a twisted fantasy world that the two of them had together. Isn't that possible? Because again, to me, the fact that he was so willing out of nowhere to help her hide a body, hide a weapon, all of the above, doesn't track either. Yeah, it feels very, I'm going to, I'll help you hide this body and then we'll wait and I'll tell the police about the body and then you'll blame me and I'll blame you and they won't be able to pin it on either of us is how it kind of feels like they were going for I don't know or it's just it's like we're gonna prove we're so smart that we will totally do this crime this perfect crime and get away with it no one will ever catch it and then weeks go by and no one said anything about it so they're like well we got to throw them a bone and then it's, oh, yeah, by the way, there's the body to see, like, how many layers can we go before just to prove that we're smarter than everybody else? Totally. And I will add to that and say, isn't it also possible that Bill could have absolutely been involved in that death? Yep. In that shooting? We know that there was six gunshot wounds close up on that body. Is it possible that they did it for kicks or did it for whatever reason, got away with it, hit it. And then it was like, what's next? Let's up the ante. Let's build yeah. this extreme, you know, bomb story, this movie story. Yeah. He bought a freezer specifically to help her hide the body on a whim to help an old girlfriend, an ex-fiance out of the goodness of his heart. I don't buy it. There's something else yeah. there. Oh, yeah. I guarantee if any, any of my exes were like, hey, I know it's been a while. I need you to help me with a body. I would be like, just one second. Hit record. Continue. And then let the police know. <laughs> be like, just tell me everything. Okay, well, I'll call you back. Then you call the police and you tell them everything you know. And Is like, it possible? No. <laughs> Is it possible? They killed the first one. They could have even killed her first, the first kill of hers together. Who knows? They were together before she killed that guy for the first time. So it's possible. What if this, they did that, then yeah. they did another, then they're like, let's kick it up a notch. They come up with this grander. Maybe they watched Saw. I'm not even kidding. Cause it's very similar to one of the things you might see in one of those. Sure. Movies. They come up with this whole thing. Something happens she does piss him off or upset him in whatever way. And that's when he goes to the cops. Yeah. They're both volatile. We know that. Or he finds out that he has cancer and he's like, I'm going to turn her in before I go. I'm going to prove that I'm smarter than her. I'm going to get one over on her in the end. Oh, it makes sense. I also question, did they kill her husband? He right. died, like he banged his head on a table and hemorrhaged and whatever, but it's like, he wasn't feeling well suddenly for like a week or two before this. And it's like, were they poisoning him doing something? And that's how he was dizzy. And he happened to hit his head. And they're like, wow, look at that. You know? I mean, to me, I just think 
I mean, obviously we will never know the truth because the main players have, have passed. So I'm sure that this will never truly come to light, but it does feel to me like if we are to believe that Bill's involvement with her started and ended with moving a body into a freezer. Yeah. And that was kind of it. And then he had a loose involvement in the, in the bank heist. I just think that, that, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And I think, uh, and we also know that he had tried to help dispose of a weapon years prior to how do we know it wasn't also th- that he wasn't doing stuff with her around that time? Yep. Oh yeah. I do not trust this man in anything about this. And all it took was him sitting in a police interrogation and going, huh, you know what? I'm the smartest man in this room. That was the moment I was like, oh, yep. Nope. Don't like him. Something's not right. Also not something that someone says who has altruistic intentions. Yep. In my opinion, I listen, I may wear a psychologist hat by choice, not by having any sort of right to, um, but my diagnosis as a at-home doctor is, I don't buy it. No. Christy Oxborough, what a gift. <laughs> I, uh, I, ha- I hadn't watched this in a while, and this, let me tell you, this just makes me feel uh, I, I mean, jazzed. I mean, this was just such a, such a joy to, to, to walk through with you. It never stopped like just when you're like this is approximately the layout and then you're like nope you gotta add all these eight things so it's it's been a journey and i'm excited to not have marjorie in my brain anymore (laughs) yeah it's it's heavy it's heavy in there yeah i hear that yeah Listen, dear listeners, we're so glad that you joined us for this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Uh, If you haven't followed us on social media, give us a follow. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at True Crime and Cocktails, Twitter, at Not Detectives. Patreon, if you'd like a little bit more, some bonus episodes over there you can subscribe to. Patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails. Whole lot of fun. And the only place to get True Crime and Cocktails merch is TrueCrewMerch.com. Check it out. Holiday items are available. You got to get them soon if you want them in time for the big day in December. Um, if you celebrate it, if you don't, doesn't matter. Then you can have lots of time. But just saying, get on it if you'd like. Um, Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? Uh, sure. I'm just writing down <laughs> to remind myself to order the Christmas shirt tomorrow because I have not done that yet. I've got an in. I've got an in. I can make that happen. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, I always mean to, and then 80 things come up and I never think about it. I get it. Oh boy. On the next true crime and cocktails. And we promise we actually do mean next week. Yep. (laughs) This time. Yep. True crime and fairy tales, beauty and the beast. That's right, dear listeners. We did share with you our True Crime and Fairy Tales Ariel, the Little Mermaid episode uh, a little while back. It was originally a Patreon episode of the show, and there was such a wonderful response that we thought we should also share with you our Beauty and the Beast episode. So I cannot wait for you to hear. Uh, I am the person in the in the research seat on that episode, and yeah. it's a whole heck of a lot of fun. So get ready for that. Until then, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Dave girl. Good night. Good night, future time traveling us. (laughs)